Everyone, and uh, could I welcome you to the committee's 17th meeting in 2019. Could I ask you all please to make sure your mobile uh, phones are on silent. We're moving on to agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation, uh, draft welfare of farmed animals, Scotland amendment regulations 2019, and the code of uh, for the welfare of meat chickens and breeding chickens, revocation Scotland notice 2019. This item, uh, this agenda item, is to cover, cover those points, and the committee will take evidence from Murray Gujar, the Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment. The motion seeking the approval of the affirmative instrument will be considered at item three, and that seeking approval for the notice will be taken at item four. I should say to members that there have been no representations to the committee on the affirmative instrument. Uh, before I welcome the minister, because this is a matter of uh, relating to agriculture and farming, I would like to ask if there are any members of the committee that would like to make a declaration of interest. Peter. Convener, I would like to make a declaration in that I'm a partner in a farming business. And indeed, I would like to make a declaration <coughs> that I have a farming business, but it does not involve chickens. Um, I therefore would like to welcome the Minister, uh, Marie Goujon, and I'd also like to welcome the supporting officials, Andrew Verse, the veterinary head of animal welfare, and Grant McClarty, if I got that right, good, thank you, Solicitor for the Scottish Government. Minister, would you like to make a brief opening statement of up to three minutes? Uh, yes, please, uh, and thank you and good morning to the committee. Now, I wrote to the convener on the 29th of March to let the committee know that the Scottish Government would be publishing new guidance on the welfare of meat chickens and meat breeding chickens on the 1st of April. This guidance replaces the obsolete code of practice for the welfare of meat chickens, which was published in 2000. And five. The purpose of the draft regulations we're looking at today is to amend the Welfare of Farmed Animal Regulations 2010 in consequence of the publication of that guidance. Now, amongst other things, the 2010 regulations place requirements on those responsible for farmed animals in relation to codes of practice. And in particular, they require that those responsible for farmed animals are acquainted with any relevant animal welfare code and have access to that code while attending to the animal. They also require that anyone employed or engaged by the person responsible for the animal is acquainted with, has access to, and has received instruction and guidance on the code and the regulations make non-compliance with those requirements an offence. The purpose of the draft regulations in front of us today is to create the same requirements in relation to Scottish Government animal welfare guidance documents, so that those responsible for farmed animals and anyone they employ will have a statutory duty to be acquainted with any relevant animal welfare guidance and to have access to it when they're attending to an animal. And the revocation notice we are also looking at today is to revoke the existing code of practice on meat chickens. This will avoid there being any, confuse, any confusion as to which guidelines should be followed by stockkeepers and what they have a statutory duty to be acquainted with. The combined effect of the documents we're looking at will be the old code of practice on meat chickens will no longer be in force and the requirements which had been in force in relation to this code will now apply in relation to the new meat chicken guidance. And my officials and I would be happy to take any questions from the committee on that. Thank you, Minister. Um, looking around the table, uh, Jamie Green, you've got a question. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, uh, panel. Can I ask uh, two separate questions? The first is, can I ask... Uh, uh, what evidence has led you to suggest that the previous guidelines were not sufficient? Uh, was there any evidence of malpractice or any specific incidents that you can refer to that uh, spurred the government into making the change? And can I also ask what consultation took place uh, prior to the uh, issuing or to the drafting of the guidelines, including a consultation? Uh, with uh, chicken farmers themselves, and I've got no uh, interest to declare in that matter. In relation to the updating of the guidance, this was uh, essentially done because the code, as I said in my opening statement, was introduced in 2005 and legislation has uh, moved on significantly in that time. So the, just to give you a, an idea and a summary of some of the changes that have been made, uh, although some of the wording from the original code is carried over, the guidance uh, has been completely rewritten in particular to refer to new legal requirements in the welfare of farmed animals regulation 
Regulations 2010 that came into force following the 2007 EU Directive on Meat, Chicken, Welfare. And essentially what that did was introduce changes on health monitoring and reporting results of post-mortem inspections at abattoirs, as well as technical requirements for ventilation and temperature control. So in order to really essentially benefit and improve animal welfare, that's why the guidance, well, it was essential that we introduced up-to-date uh, up guidance that we're putting before the committee today. And sorry, what was your second uh, question? What consultation did you undertake uh, with the industry, including chicken farmers themselves? Uh, we consulted with industry and also with animal welfare organisations uh, in relation to the guidance. Okay, thank you. Deputy Convener has got a question for you. Gail Ross. Thank you. Good morning, Minister and panel. Um, Minister, you said, um, uh, you mentioned about an EU directive. Will this um, need to change at all when we leave the European Union or will the guidance just continue as we agreed today? In relation to the guidance, I, I mean, essentially what we'd be looking to do anyway as, through the process of leaving the EU is really to ensure that our, our, we keep pace with what's happening at an EU level. But the fact is we've already uh, transposed this uh, directive into Scottish legislation anyway. So what we've laid out today, I wouldn't imagine would change regardless of whether we, we leave the EU or not. And I imagine, yeah, that's correct. Um. Thank you. Uh, Minister, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, uh, first of all, uh, under the animal welfare guidance, uh, non-compliance uh, goes to a, as far as I can see, a level four uh, fine, is it, and, and three months in prison for, for non-compliance. Um, I just wondered if, how you see that working in relation with cross-compliance regulations, because, you know, that, that's putting a... Uh, a uh, a criminal conviction as well as cross-compliance. How do the two going to work together? So if somebody is guilty of animal welfare, uh, are they going to lose their cross-compliance as well as being fined and potentially going to uh, uh, jail? Well, I wouldn't say that what we're looking at today isn't really introducing anything new in relation to uh, the, the offences in itself. I mean... In, with, in relation to the, the Code of Practice from 2005, it's an offence not to... Uh, it's an offence to not be, uh, be acquainted with that guidance, uh, with the Code of Practice. It's also an offence not to be acquainted with the guidance that we have before us today. So in relation to any of the penalties as a result of that, that's not what the guidance would be changing because the offences would, would essentially stay the same and they haven't changed. What we have done, we've recently consulted on the introduction of fixed penalty notices in relation to animal welfare offences as part of the amendments we're looking to make to the Animal Health and Welfare Act of 2006. Um, but we don't have any immediate plans at the moment anyway to introduce them for farm animal, uh, for farm animal offences uh, where we currently have the cross-compliance system for penalties and where that already exists. So I don't know if that clarifies so, matters uh, at all. My question is, uh, somebody uh, who, who's guilty of an animal welfare breach could also lose their single farm payment in relation uh, because they failed on cross-compliance. Is that what you're saying? Because that seems to be a, a, a uh, double, yeah, pu double to punishment. I think possibly the question isn't really related to the guidance. It's related to the current position where you, maybe you're suggesting there's elements of double jeopardy that somebody could be convicted Correct. of a welfare offence as well as having a cross-compliance penalty. Is that what you're, yes. you're getting at? Yeah. I mean, that, that obviously is the current situation. Um, I think the argument is that in most cases, a cross-compliance penalty would apply and that normally further proceedings would tend not to be taken by the local authority or by APHA. But I think technically the cross-compliance penalty is really separate from the um, prosecution for a welfare offence. So okay. if somebody is guilty of a welfare offence, they are liable to prosecution. Okay. As a separate matter, they could also be uh, subject to a cross-compliance penalty. And that's under the rules of cross-compliance. It's not really um, concerned with the welfare offence as such. Okay. And, and there's a paragraph in the uh, legislation that says um, a person responsible for a farm animal has access to the guidance while attending the animal. Now, uh, does that mean that if I'm dealing with chickens, that I have to have the guidance for welfare of meat chickens and meat breeding chickens regulations and guidance in my pocket? What, what does that actually mean? Could you just define what access to the guidance means? 
while attending the animal, because that infers you have to have it with you. Well, it's obviously the same wording that applies to the code at the moment, so that's wording that has been around for a long time, and people understand that to mean that, you know, it obviously doesn't mean that people carry around the paper copy with them at all times when they're on the farm, but as long as they should be aware that the guidance exists and maybe have a copy in the farm office or have some way of getting access to it. Really, the point is that people shouldn't be able to claim that they didn't know what the guidance was if okay. they're attending chickens. I mean, that's, that's really the, the purpose of the legislation. Okay, so you're, you're happy that... Uh, I mean, just so I understand that it, it's sufficient that access means that it could be in the farm office, could be at home, could be, could be anywhere, but they have had ability to, to get a look at it before they deal with the animal. Okay, and then just turning to, to uh, look at the guidance in relation to chickens, I'm, I'm a bit worried that some of it is, is quite, um, uh, quite vague, in, in my humble opinion. It says, culling, for example, in paragraph 38, it says, culling training should be provided by a stock person with appropriate experience. Now, what does appropriate experience mean? Um, I think there are some elements of guidance where we can't be very prescriptive because we want to allow for different situations that may exist on different farms. Um, typically with meat chickens, they will belong to large companies who will have experienced managers and experienced stock people who could train new staff or less experienced staff. So we don't want to be very prescriptive and say it has to be this particular form of training. We want to allow... You know, reasonable flexibility for what is suitable in the circumstances. But I would say as well, if the committee or if there are any particular issues that you think you have in relation to the guidance in itself, then I'd be happy if, if you wanted to write to me with any issues in particular in relation to the guidance that uh, the officials and both myself could consider. I think, Minister, my, my concern is, is, is how to quantify appropriate experience because what, you're, what is suggesting um, that uh, there are significant fines which could lead to imprisonment as a result of not complying with the guidance. And, and I'm un, unable in my experience to find out what a appropriate experience would be for, for uh, culling injured birds on the farm because there is no particular cause. I just happened to pick that out uh, because it was one of the things that had been brought forward. But there are some things in welfare where it says appropriate experience and it is not quantifiable and there are not courses to allow you to, to, to carry out and prove that you've had appropriate experience. And, and that therefore rings alarm bells to me, Minister. Does it not to you? Oh, I'm happy to, to look into that, and if you think that's for, something that needs further clarification, then that's something that we could certainly look at. I, th I think without it becoming too restrictive, but without it being a millstone which can be hung around somebody's neck who has experience for maybe 20 years of, of, of working in a chicken farm, if that's what it means, that, 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 that I would, I would mm -hmm. accept. Absolutely. So, and, but another point I would say as well is that on, I mean, as I mentioned in my answer to Jamie Green earlier, I mean, we do consult on the guidance and consult with animal, animal welfare organisations and with industry as well. Uh, we also have the Farm and Animal Welfare Commission, which provides independent advice to the UK government as well as to the devolved administrations who have also looked over the guidance too. So what we have produced here is something that has been, uh, that these bodies are generally content with as well. But like I say, if there are particular points in the guidance that you think we need to address or look at, then I'd be happy to take those into consideration. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Jamie, yes. Just a small supplementary. Uh, thank you, and thanks for your, your answers to the previous questions. Um, can I just ask, if, if in the uh, situation where uh, an inspection is made or a spot check is performed, perhaps an unannounced visit to a chicken farm, um, and there is insufficient uh, codes of practice in the vicinity, uh, is the liability on the person who's handling the animal, as, it's, as you described earlier, or is the liability uh, or the enforcement of it on the owner of the premise? And I think that's something I'm not clear on. Uh, in the guidance, it states, I think it's, it's section 24 that we have in the, the Animal Health and Welfare Act, 
to, oh sorry, no, that's the wrong one. It's the Welfare of Farmed Animals Regulations 2010, and that's what it states in it. Offense, it's an offence not to be acquainted with the guidance if you are the person that is responsible for, or if you are, uh, if you have employees, it's your responsibility to make sure that they're also acquainted with that guidance and they have access to the guidance as well. So it's if you are the responsible person for the meat chickens themselves. I don't know if that answers your question it's, or if there's you, you any... You sort of imply both in that respect, then. It's the person who has to make that information available to their employees, but it's also the responsibility of the employee to seek out that information. Is that correct or not? Of the employer to ensure that their employee is acquainted with that guidance and has access to that guidance as well. Okay. And that's how it's written in the, in the uh, Welfare of Farmed Animals regulations. I see. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, we'll then move on to agenda item three, um, which is the formal consideration of motion S5M17291 in the name of the Minister for Rural Affairs and the Natural Environment, calling on the committee to recommend the welfare of farmed animals Scotland amendment regulations 2019 draft be appro approved. Sorry, to be approved. Minister, uh, would I, could I ask you to move the motion um, 17291 and ask if you have any further comments to make? I don't have any further comments to, to make and I would move that the draft welfare of Farmed Animals Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019 and the Code for the Welfare of Meat Chickens and Breeding Chickens Revocation Scotland Notice 2019 be approved. Uh, we're going to come on to the second part in a minute. We're going to d deal with each of them individually. So the first question is motion uh, 17291 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes our consideration of item three. I'd therefore like to move on to item four, which is the Code for the Welfare of Meat, Chickens and Breeding Chickens Revocation Scotland Notice 2019. This is the formal consideration of motion 17290 in the name of the Minister of Rural Affairs and Natural Environment, calling on the committee to recommend the Code of Welfare of Meat, Chickens and Breeding Chickens, Revocation Scotland Notice 2019. I, Minister, you have already moved it. Just for the record, could you just move it again, please? I move that again. Uh, do you have any further comments? And no further comments. Right. I therefore ask the committee uh, uh, whether we are agreed. Are we agreed? Yes. We are. We are agreed. And that concludes our consideration of... Uh, item four. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, gender item six, which is the subordinate legislation roadworks qualifications of operatives and supervisors Scotland amendment regulations. This item is to consider one negative instrument as detailed in the agenda. No motions to annul or representations have been received in relation to the instrument. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to the instrument? That is agreed. Therefore, I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to depart who already have departed and for us to allow to set up for the next item. So I therefore suspend the meeting. Okay. I'd like to reconvene the meeting and move on to agenda item seven. Uh, this is the first evidence session on the policy intention of stage two amendments on the Transport Scotland Bill on the proposed working place parking levy. We have two panels giving evidence today. The first session will be con conducted by video conference and I'd like to welcome the first panel 
giving evidence on the working uh, on the from the Nottingham City Council's experience of the working place parking levy. Chris Carter, who is the head of transport strategy, Nottingham City Council. Chris, could you just hold up your hands? Perfect. So Hello. I can hear you, and I now know who you are. That's great. Okay. And Professor Stephen Eisner, <coughs> Professor of Transport Policy of Loughborough University. Um, Professor Eisner has taken a research on Nottingham's experience on the working place parking levy. Now, um, if I could just say, uh, there is, we've got one declaration of interest that we'd like to do before we go any further. Richard. Yes, uh, convener, and I think it would only be right, uh, whilst I know that Aviva has not uh, uh, come to the committee, uh, I have to intimate that I receive a small pension from Aviva, which they manage on behalf of a company that used to do my pension. OK, thank you very much. Um, the, the way this will work, um, uh, Chris, is, 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 is that each of the members are going to ask you a series of, of questions. Um, and uh, we'll go in, in an order um, which I will determine. And, and what they'll do is they'll get a chance. And, and as they're coming to the end of their session, I, I will try and wave at them to get them to stop. But when you're answering the question, it'll be up to the member. If I think you're expanding beyond the remit, I, you might see me wave like that. And, and unfortunately, you're not, you're not in the room, so I can't do what I threaten to everyone else, is that if they continue to speak after I've waved a few times, is that my pen starts to wag, and then it launches across the room. Of course, it will... It, it would, it, it, I've never done it, and it would have no effect to you because you're, you're on screen. So, um, first of all, welcome to the Parliament, and thank you very much for, for giving evidence. And the first question uh, this morning is going to be from... Mike Rumbles, Mike. Thank you very much, convener, and, and, and welcome. Um, really, my questions are straightforward ones. Why did Nottingham City Council decide to develop a working uh, parking levy scheme in the first place? But almost more importantly, why do you think that Nottingham City Council is the only local authority in England and Wales to have introduced the parking levy since the passage of the Transport Act 19 years ago. Why are you such so unique? Okay, I think I'll, um, I'll give you a little bit of background to, to why Nottingham um, set out on this course. I think uh, Nottingham has been following a sort of integrated transport policies for uh, a number of years now. And uh, like many other cities, Nottingham uh, suffers from congestion. And uh, we sort of know that incentives on their own aren't enough to uh, influence behaviour change. So, um, uh, you know, there's plenty of research out there that says that you need to have some um, sort of uh, uh, sticks, if you like, uh, if you're going to uh, encourage uh, modal change. So with that in mind, uh, Nottingham looked at the legislation when it came in in 2000 and uh, was very much influential in getting the workplace parking levy included that in that because we saw that the workplace parking levy fitted the needs of the city. Um, we were very much impacted by uh, traffic coming in from further afield into the city's area. Uh, it's a, not even obviously a centre for commerce and jobs and uh, a lot of employment. Our problem is effectively um, peak time congestion and we saw the workplace parking levy as a perfect tool for influence of behaviour, but also very importantly for investing in um, high quality public transport alternatives. And we identified a package of measures that uh, basically included uh, the tram system, expansion of our tram system. We'd already implemented one line of our tram in 2004. And actually the workplace parking levy was seen as very much a way of providing a local contribution to the tram to allow that to be expanded uh, to give a, a much more comprehensive system um, across the city. It also was used to invest in Nottingham Station. Uh, businesses identified that Nottingham Station was not an attractive gateway into the city and it was important for them that that was improved and also um, improving our bus services. Uh, we used the money to actually invest in a fleet of electric buses uh, that are used on tendered services. And that's particularly important for serving perhaps some of the areas that are not served by the commercial network, 
places like business parks, for example, that traditionally hadn't got a good uh, bus service, uh, we use some of the money for that to invest in that as well. So it's very much seen as part of a package of measures. But if I could, if I could ask, though, if it's such a success and such a very positive thing, why are you the only council after 19 years who've, who've done this? Yeah, I think... Can I, can I say a little bit about that? I mean, uh, historically, when the legislation was put in place, there were quite a number of local authorities, I think probably close to 25 that were interested, either in road pricing or in the workplace parking levy. Uh, but you have to have a number of things in place before you can implement a policy which actually um, is, as a dis disincentive, not seen as very acceptable. Uh, whether it's road pricing or, or, or uh, the workplace parking levy. And I think Nottingham had a number of things that were in place which allowed it to do that, one of which was uh, a stable council, political situation, which I think you need. Uh, secondly, I think it had uh, a number of policy champions, and uh, I don't underestimate that. I mean, that is very important for any local authority or any government that wants to introduce it. You need to have a champion. Uh, and also they had a requirement or a need and that was the development of the, of the tram network and so hypothecation of the revenue was an important uh, part of that and, uh, and that I think is also part of the reason why. My, I'm sorry, time is short and, 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 and I would say that the shorter we can keep the answers and, and the, more, the more dialogue we can get between us is better. I'm going to move on. John Mason, yours is the next one. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener. And um, uh, asking about the finances, my understanding is that over the first five years of the levy, you have raised £53 million approximately. Uh, so I'm interested where that money has gone. You, you used the word hypothecated just now, because I understand that the tram network has cost f £570 million, railway 60 and the buses 200 So um, obviously the, the levy hasn't fully paid for that. So how does that work? No, that, that's right. Now, um, take, for example, the, the tram system. Uh, the total cost is about 500 million. The local contribution is about 100 million. Uh, basically, it all goes into a financial model because there's lots of different funding streams that actually pay for all of those measures. And they are just, the, if you like, the city council's co contributions to those programmes. I mean, it's important to identify that actually the workplace parking levy levers in a lot more other investment to fund those the total cost of those improvements. Okay, um, so, right. So it's would would have made would these improvements have happened anyway without the levy? Definitely not. No. No. So so they may have made a significant difference, even though they're only a small part of the expenditure. Correct. Yeah, it's our local contributions generally is what we would describe it as. Okay, that's helpful. And the second part of my question was uh, around traffic congestion. I mean, has the levy had an impact on traffic congestion? Yes, it's had a, an impact. It's obviously very difficult to disentangle what any measure will do in terms of traffic. Uh, but the figures do suggest that there has been, uh, when, you come, when you compare it with a number of comparator cities, there has been a, a reduction in the overall level of congestion following the introduction of the workplace levy. Which okay. you'd expect from a, from a charge which is looking to uh, impact on demand. Okay, so it, it hasn't actually reduced the amount of traffic, but it's, it's reduced the growth in traffic. Is that, is that exactly. mark, correct? That's right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks very much. Okay, uh, next questions from uh, Peter Chapman. Peter. Thanks, convener, and uh, good morning, gentlemen. I mean, you, you've all already outlined that you have invested hugely in public transport on the tram system, on buses and on trains. So I imagine that the, that has led to greater use of public transport. Just that, that simple investment in its own right would have meant that public transport would have been greater, used great, more, great, more uh, frequently. But how, how, do you, how do you conflate that with the actual working place levy? You know, what percentage of that increased traffic on public is because of the, the actual levy in place, or because of the fact that you've invested a lot in the in the public transport systems? Um, I think it's quite difficult to disentangle the impact that a particular measure will have on on, on anything. But uh, the work that we've done would suggest that public transport mode share has uh, 
has changed dramatically uh, since the completion of the workplace parking levy. Uh, there's been an uptake in um, cycling uh, across the board uh, and bus patronage has, uh, has, has, has increased uh, over that period. Of course, if you reduce the number of spaces, which is what's happened from about 35,000 down to uh, 20, 29 or so, then it's going to have an impact on, because you, you're impacting on the termination point of traffic. So it's going to have some impact, and a number of people then have taken up alternatives, including the tram, which has been, uh, been developed uh, in part by the funding from the workplace parking levy. I mean, there's, there's three elements that really drive this. There's, one is the direct impact of the levy itself, the fact that you're actually introducing a charge. Now, that is a relatively small amount in terms of the total cost. So the actual direct uh, mode change from the introduction of the levy itself is probably small. Um, there's also the, the behaviour of the businesses, because the levy is a, is a, if you like, a tax on the business, um, and it's dependent on the number of parking spaces that they provide. So obviously if a business reduces the number of spaces, that has an impact. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third element is obviously in the investment of the public transport alternatives. And I would say that's probably the biggest element that, that has driven modal change. Yeah, well, just to, to follow up a wee bit on that, has the parking levy encouraged more people to commute by bike or, or to, to walk to work? Have you any evidence to suggest that's, that has also happened? Yes, yeah, there, there's, we've seen a, over the last 10 years about a 50% increase in the number of cycling, uh, people cycling. I haven't got the figures for, for walking in particular, but that, you know, it's encouraging all sustainable modes in terms of uh, behaviour change. Mm. Okay, thank you. Peter, um, thank you. Uh, John Finney, yours, the next one. Thank you, Gavinar. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, you, you've touched on congestion. Can I ask what impact, if any, that the workplace parking levies had on local air pollution levels, please? The, probably, um, uh, the workplace parking levy has been primarily implemented as a congestion measure. And um, we have sort of kept it separate from our uh, air quality strategy. Um, but I'll, clearly there is a link. And effect, uh, what I would describe it as is the workplace parking levy plus the improvements has helped to uh, contain traffic in Nottingham. So we have seen lower levels of traffic growth uh, than, than many other areas. Now, in terms of air quality, we were identified as one of the areas um, that was predicted to be in excess of air quality limits by 2020 uh, and we conducted our own local modelling to look into that further. Now because of the levy and all the improvements that we've been making and other investments by local public transport operators, Nottingham now has a plan in place that's been agree agreed by the government that basically means through retrofitting of buses um, and changes to our taxes we will now comply uh, with the, with the um, air quality uh, regulations, um, and that is because partly because the levy has been in place. Uh, you, you mentioned a, a suite of measures there. Is it is it able to identify what component part of that the working place parking levy has been, please? I, I can't. You know, it's really difficult to to isolate individual measures, particularly as the levy has been presented as part of a package. So I think that that's what's really difficult because. You know, people's behaviour is influenced by many factors. You know, the, the overall price, fuel prices come into it. The, the, the levy is just one small fiscal measure that influences behaviour. So, so it's really difficult to isolate an individual thing. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Can I try another one with you then, please? And that's business growth or inward investment. Are you able to comment on any potential impact that the levy's had on that, please? I mean, I think our... our finding on this is that we, we can't identify any particular business that has moved out of Nottingham as a result of the levy. Um, you know, there was, before the levy was introduced, there was a lot of uh, discussion as whether what impact it would have on inward investment. Um, and we, we haven't been able to find any evidence that people have specifically moved out because of it. Now, it, all, it always comes up as a factor when there's inward investment discussions, uh, but there's, you have to trade off the, the, the situation of um, businesses, you know, offices and things like that will want to 
uh, come to a city centre because it has good public transport access and the tram, for example, is a good um, uh, a, a, an attractor for people to invest in the city. So different businesses have different needs and, and depending on their needs, they will either see that having a high quality public transport system might be important to them, others may deem that uh, you know, if they're particularly dependent on um, cars or, or, or businesses, then they might see that that is less suitable. So I think there's, there's different needs in different areas. I'll back that up. I don't think there's been any evidence to suggest that the introduction of the workplace parking levy has led to any outward investment from companies relocating, which was one of the things that was said when the scheme was first introduced, that this would happen, and it doesn't appear to have. Uh, and I think Chris is right in that regard. I mean, one of the things that you, you have is, a, is a, a much improved public transport network, and I think that business uh, takes to that and can see the benefits of that. Uh, and so there is, there's no evidence to suggest that there is, with similar cities, that there has been a, an adverse effect on investment within the city. Okay, many thanks indeed. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Richard. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I've, had morning. The good, I've had the good fortune to be in Nottingham, and actually I know many of your politicians through an organisation called APSI. Um, would you agree you need a majority council and the political will to drive this forward in our local area? I mean, I think you need strong political leadership. Now, exactly what form that takes you know, will be different in different areas, but I think strong political leadership is absolutely essential. So um, if you're in a minor minority council situation, do you think this would pass? I think having a clear vision of what you want to do and how it forms part of a strategy, if that is agreed, then there's no reason why you couldn't do that in that situation. But I think as long as there's agreement around a vision, then, then, then it would work. But I think, as I say, leadership is the key. Yeah. What reaction did you get from the public at first introducing this? I think you have different reactions from different people. Um, city residents, who are predominantly those people who get impacted by traffic and congestion and pollution and all the adverse impacts of traffic, generally support it because they can see the benefits in the investment and they can see that that is beneficial to them. Uh, obviously, people who are likely to drive into Nottingham from further field are going to say that they, they will be negatively impacted. So it impacts different people in different ways. Yeah, I've got another two questions. Um, exemptions, you uh, say in your details you've got exemptions for customer vehicles, fleet vehicles, disabled blue badges, number of employers who are 100% discounted from the charge, such as ambulance, police, fire and qualifying NHS premises. Would you suggest that um, anyone who's introducing this should consider doing the same as you have done and get, granting all these exemptions? Well, I would actually say there are actually, in the Nottingham scheme, there are very few exemptions. I think those exemptions are more around operational vehicles or um, things that are you know, not directly commuting journeys. Uh, the only exemption, probably the significant exemption in the Nottingham scheme is the NHS one. Now, that, was, uh, you know, that came about as a result of discussion um, uh, with, with the then Secretary of State, as, as it happens. But, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I think you can, the beauty of the workplace parking levy is it is flexible, that you can actually have different exemptions to meet your own needs. The only thing I would say is the other strength of the workplace park le parking levy is its simplicity. And therefore, if you introduce too many exemptions, it becomes too complicated and you lose a lot of the benefits of the scheme. Yeah, okay. I would agree with that. A simplistic, a simplistic scheme, at least in the first instance, is very important, I would suggest. Right. In your submission, you said the scheme focuses heavily on compliance with officers working with employers to assist them in licensing their parking spaces correctly. And this is an interesting part of your submission and encouraging them to take advantage of the business support available. Can you explain that? Yes, basically we offer business support as part of the scheme. So I have an officer that basically goes around and talks to the uh, businesses that uh, pay the levy and we offer a grant scheme, for example, um, so that employers can provide uh, facilities for their staff. So, for example, um, it, it, that includes things like cycle shelters or showers, um, it, it's car park management we provide, um, also travel planning. travel planning information, electric charging more latterly, 
Um, so we do provide grants to businesses to support them to reduce their liability. Okay, thank you very much. Colin. Thank you. Um, um, good, good morning to the panel. Can, can I just clarify a couple of things on the exemptions you mentioned? They are um, NHS designated premises are exempt, but a police officer travelling to work wouldn't be exempt. A teacher travelling to a school wouldn't be exempt. Is that the case? That's correct. Yeah, frontline NHS. So if it's if it's a hospital or a, or a medical facility, that would occur. If it's just an administrative um, facility that's separate, that, that wouldn't be. So that, that wouldn't be exempt. Can, can I just t turn now to the, the, the actual cost of the levy itself? In, in Nottingham, it's set at, at £415 per uh, parking space, and, and this is often uh, passed on to, to workers themselves, So, uh, which has happened on occasion. So that means someone on, say, the salary of the Chief Executive of Nottingham City Council, £170,000 plus a year, would pay exactly the same as somebody uh, the lowest paid worker in Nottingham City Council on the living wage, the fee would be the same irrespective of their income? That's not the way it works because the levy is a charge on the employer. So the employer pays the actual charge. It's up to the employer to decide how or if at all that it passes that on to its employees. So take the City Council, it does actually um, uh, charge different amounts for different car parks in different parts of the city and it does actually change the amount that people pay uh, depending on their salary. Now that's the employer's decision to do that and there are other, other employers who do similar schemes or, or quite different schemes. Um, it's really up to the employer to decide if they charge or pass on the levy at all. So that they're all like well, sorry, sorry. sorry, there are organisations that have a very sophisticated way of allocating uh, uh, the charge to their workforce based on salary um, and also on the vehicle's engine size. And so that they have a sliding scale which takes all of that into account. So you could be paying an awful lot or you could be paying, paying very little depending on what your salary structure was like and also what type of vehicle you were using. But that has been left up to the individual That's organisations the themselves as to how they implement that, if at all. But therefore, is that not regressive though, if you allow an employer to charge the same for anybody irrespective of salary? Why haven't you not set um, that guidance to say that, that you should make it a, a more progressive level that based on salary for all that pass it on? Why was that not included in the guidance from yourselves? Why have you allowed employers effectively to, to pass the same amount on to anybody irrespective of salary? I think you know, in terms of the, the, the way the scheme works, we, it works in terms of we charge the employee employer and that's just the way the scheme's set up. But obviously we do advise employers on how they can pass it on if they choose to do so and we give them the examples of how they can do that and we probably would advise that they, you know, they, they adopt scheme, schemes like that that do vary it depending on salary. That's, that's certainly some of the examples that we give employers. I mean, there are very many organisations outside the workplace parking levy zone that, that would have schemes where they charge their um, employees to park on the workplace. And this is one in particular at Loughborough University where they will charge staff to park at the workplace. Um, and there's no impact interference from the local authority in that particular uh, charge. And just, just on the, the issue of, of travel to work areas, it would be fair to say that th this charge can only be within the Nottingham City Council area because that, that's obviously your, your only coverage. Um, would it be fair to say that most of the travel to work areas in Nottingham are pretty much urban areas? Would that be fair to say? Um, it goes beyond the urban area. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, yeah, the travel to work area goes beyond the urban area. It goes into neighbouring rural districts. So, so just on that point, do you think it's fair that somebody in a rural area that doesn't have access to public transport who has to travel into Nottingham um, uh, but using their car, but their local authority has no say whatsoever on that levy because they live out with Nottingham City Council area? Do you think that's fair, given that none of the funding raised by Nottingham City Council will go on improving public transport in that rural area because out with your, your boundary? One of the particular features of Nottingham's public transport system is park and ride. Park and ride is a very important component, particularly the tram system. And there are over 5,000 uh, parking spaces that are dotted around the urban area, all of the motorway access 
uh, routes basically have very large park and ride sites along those main routes. So people who are driving in from further afield have the option of basically driving to the edge of Nottingham, parking at a park and ride, then using one of the high quality public transport options to get to their destination, city centre or elsewhere. So I think they do have that option. Okay, um... I'm going to go to Stuart Stevenson just to say to members, we, we you, you... And I, do, I don't want this to provoke you into doing something that you're not doing already. You're all being extremely good on your time, which will mean that there will be time to bring more questions in at the end. But please don't abuse that comment. Say, so I've got Richard Lyle already uh, listed down, and, and anyone else who wants to come in, start indicating to me. Stuart, remembering what I just said. I've just started my stopwatch convener. Um, can I go back to uh, Mr Carter? You said... Uh, that having limited exemptions uh, keeps costs down. And I want to just explore that uh, in some more detail. Roughly what percentage of the money that you take in from Workcase Parking goes in administration of the scheme? Um, basically, it's about £500,000 is used to run the scheme. Now, that does include the business support element. So, so that's... So so if you say, say, say we're up to about nine and a half million pounds of income, about half a million pounds per year goes into running the scheme, including the business support element. So that's about 6%? Something like that, yeah. Right. Um, and uh, are there any particular lessons you've learned? I mean, this is something you in, you've been running for some considerable time. Have you managed to press down on the administration costs or have you found them rising? Uh, what's the trend? No, I would say that the, uh, the, the, the running of the scheme has been um, pretty consistent since it, since it began. I think what we do do is we do a lot of compliance work. So what we haven't spent money on, which perhaps we might have done, is, is in terms of having to enforce the scheme. But what we do do is do a lot of work with employers to ensure that there is this very high level of compliance. So that's probably what I would say the lesson is that the more work you do in compliance can, can actually make sure that you're, you're minimising the cost of administering the scheme. So you're not spending very much money on enforcement, but you are spending money on ensuring compliance. And I, I, I just wanted to ask, have you had much issues with non-compliance and how have you dealt with them? Basically, we've had relatively no issues with uh, enforcement. It's, it has been. Um, what we're finding is that by having dialogue with businesses and repeated dialogue with businesses, we are getting to a situation where uh, they're providing the information that's required and um, the scheme is running smoothly. Uh, when did the well, scheme... Sorry, a big so, professor. I'm just going to say, just a, a follow-on from that. One of the ways in which they introduced the scheme in Nottingham was to say if you had over 10, 11 spaces, then you, you, you were charged, but below that you weren't. And so that cut down the number of, uh, of employers that were subjected to the charge. So you have, in the region, I think of 500 that are subject to the charge, but over 3,000 organisations within, uh, within the city boundaries. And that, that made life easier in terms of uh, implementation. Who, who finds the, place, the parking places that are liable for the charge? Is that something the district valuer does or is it done otherwise? No, we, we basically write to all employees, uh, employers and basically you, they're, they're required to fill in a return and then we, we've got a number of tools that we'll then use to actually go out. Usually that involves visits, going around and having a look. Obviously we do have the powers to actually inspect people's car parks. We do have a video car that can go around and count vehicles within, within car parks. So uh, that's all part of the compliance. Um, uh, fi finally, my last 20 seconds, a very brief answer. Uh, I visited See the Trams on 23rd September 2004. Was that before or after the workplace parking uh, started? When was that, sorry? 2004. 2004 was when the first line of Nottingham Tram was built. That was done before the workplace parking levy. We extended the tram system in 2015, which was afterwards. Thank you. So the, the, tram, the workplace parking came in in 2012. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, questions come from Maureen Moore. Maureen. 
Um, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, have the taxation arrangements for the workplace parking levy had, had have have they had any impact on whether uh, employers have chosen to pass that payment uh, of the levy to employees? Do you have any idea of of how it works with each employer? I mean, generally, I mean, if I'm talking generalities, I would say that. Any public sector employer tends to, you know, is generally passed on the levy to its employees. Then it, when it comes to private businesses, probably half of the larger employers have passed it on. Probably less of the smaller employers have passed it on, is the broad picture, I would say. And how has that gone down with employees? Because it is a benefit in kind, is it not? So it will affect their taxation. Uh, I'm not aware of that because it is, it's a tax on the employer, not on the employee. So it's, it affects the business rather than the individual. So if they pass it on to the employee, then the employee cannot take that, it's not tax, it doesn't affect their tax system, is that what, their tax, is that what you're saying? That's, that's as I understand it, yeah. Is that what you understand, Professor, as well? It is indeed, yeah. Um, can I go back to something that you said earlier? I'm not sure if I picked you up correctly, um, but you said um, that uh, other companies, other businesses, for example, Loughborough University, uh, have their own charging schemes. Is that what yes, I picked Yes, you'll find that across the country, that a lot of employers are charging their employees for parking at the workplace. And in terms of, if we take Loughborough University as an example, uh, do you know how they use that money that they uh, raise? Uh, no, I'm not privy to how they use that money. Um, across the country, uh, not talking about Loughborough specifically, but uh, organisations may well hypothecate that uh, to use for improvements in, in um, provision, public transport provision, maybe improving the car parking, maybe improving lighting on, 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 on the, the, the sites, etc. Uh, and some will put it into their general pot. So they, I don't think there is any specific um, way in which that uh, transpires. So in your research in this area, Professor Eisen, is, you know, where that has happened with companies, does that make them less attractive to employees or does it have, has it had any advantages or disadvantages? Well, it seems an odd one, doesn't it, to charge you to go to, to, to park at the workplace. But, um, the, the, you know, a lot of um, organisations are at very constrained sites where it's, it's quite difficult. They, they, you know, may well have to implement a permit system. Uh, they just haven't got the, the, the space for uh, employees and therefore a number of them are introduced to charge on that particular, uh, for that particular reason. Is that then not discriminatory in some ways because there may be people uh, who have childcare responsibilities who need to get from their work to the nursery, for example, in a uh, pretty quick time? Is that, does that yes, not work I, out as being discriminatory? I've done work in a number of organisations in the past, a number of hospitals that aren't part of, the, of Nottingham City, um, etc., a number of universities. Uh, they well, may well have, and a number do have, quite sophisticated schemes as to how they go about dealing with issues of childcare, working on dual sites, difficulties with, with looking after uh, ageing parents and so on and so forth. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's not a, a, a one-size-fits-all by any means. But of course, the more complex you make a scheme, the more difficult it is to, to administer it. But I can take your point and I accept what you're saying. OK, thank you. Uh, Jamie Green. Jamie, you're the next one. Uh, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to you, gentlemen. Um, I'd like to touch on a few other questions. I, I, I've heard a lot this morning about the financial benefits to the local authority uh, of raising uh, revenue from the scheme, but I haven't heard a huge amount of evidence from you uh, in terms of uh, any benefits uh, to uh, either improving the air quality or environment of the city, uh, or indeed any uh, significant uh, evidence to suggest that congestion has been reduced as a direct result of the measure. Now, you said it was uh, primarily 
to tackle congestion, but all I've heard is it seems to be to be raising revenue. So could you enlighten me further? Well, I think it's very difficult to disentangle the impact that any scheme will have on, uh, on uh, congestion and on the environment. But I think intuitively, if you think of a scheme that is actually um, seen as a disincentive to use the private car in favour of public transport or in terms of walking or cycling, then by definition there's, there's going to be some improvement both in the level of congestion and also in the uh, in the environment. Yeah, that, that's uh, the that's the theory. But I, I, you know, you've had a number of years of experience of the scheme now. Can you can you evidence that well, with some numbers, say, perhaps? The work that we've done, we've seen that the the level of congestion um, hasn't uh, increased as much in Nottingham as it has in comparative uh, cities. I think there's work still to be done on the the uh, air quality uh, aspect of it. To be fair. Okay, uh, that's fine. Um, can I ask uh, uh, another line of questioning? Um, uh, my uh, reading of reports of your scheme seems to suggest that actually what many drivers are doing is rather than uh, uh, suffering the consequence of the, f of the levy, are actually parking their cars in the suburbs surrounding the city centre, causing uh, parking chaos in the suburban streets surrounding, and I could name a number of uh, villages and suburbs of Nottingham where I've read evidence of that occurring. What analysis have you done on the displacement of vehicles that used to park at their place of work who now park, park in the suburbs of your city? And I think, I think displacement is definitely one of the probably the key issues that has to be addressed uh, if you're considering a workplace parking levy scheme. Within the city itself, we have actually paid quite a lot of attention to um, uh, parking restrictions and control of parking around employment sites and we have actually put in a number of additional schemes around those sites that might be restrictions in terms of uh, preventing parking around an employment site if it's causing a nuisance or it might be in the form of providing more residence parking schemes so we have actually significantly increased the amount of residence parking schemes very much for the reason that you've said in terms of provide making sure that uh, residential areas are not impacted um, by displaced parking. I mean that does happen anyway, I mean as Sun C mentioned that many employers don't provide sufficient parking around their sites so you know without the levy you get displaced parking and um, parking in residential areas, many areas suffer from that and that, that's a very common um, uh, situation across the country uh, at least with our scheme we, we've got some um, uh, it's aimed at providing improvements in public transport <laughs> to actually try and address that and actually encourage people to use public transport instead of driving so, so that's very interesting so it sounds like you've had to uh, actually introduce measures to secure and guarantee residents parking spaces on their own streets as a result of displacement because of the levy is that what you've just said I'm saying that that has been an important aspect of that. There's, you know, again, there's different reasons why you put residence parking schemes in areas, but, but to protect um, residential areas from commuter parking is a very common thing to do, but it's been an important aspect of Nottingham. And uh, because of the workplace parking levy, there's probably been more displacement than you would get elsewhere. So I think that is an important thing for any authority who's considering a workplace parking levy scheme needs to consider the impacts of potential displaced parking. That's definitely true. But I think that's an issue in general. I mean, the large generators of traffic and hospitals, are, as I've said, are a part of that. There will be some parking off-site on residential streets and you have to tackle that particular problem uh, by the use of double yellow lines, control parking or whatever. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next question, Jamie. If you've got another question, you can come back at the end. Uh, Gail Ross, and then followed by me. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. I just <clears throat> want to, uh, for clarification, does Nottingham have any other measures such as uh, low emission zones or congestion charging? We don't have congestion charging. Um, we're not introducing a low emission zone. We were considering implementing a uh, clean air zone and we were originally going to be mandated by the government to do that, but following our, our more detailed work and, and local modelling, we're no longer required to do a charging zone to address air quality issues. 
we're addressing our air quality issues through bus retrofitting and uh, taxi policies now. So that's the focus of our air quality strategy. So what made you choose the workplace parking levy over a low emission zone or a congestion charge? I think uh, basically, uh, as I said previously, I think the workplace parking levy fitted with our, our strategy. Um, partly to do with the administrative boundary, I would say, was, was uh, part of that, in that uh, Nottingham has a very tight boundary um, and therefore was suffering from commuter traffic coming from further afield into the city area. So the workplace parking only fitted well with that. We needed, obviously, we were trying to identify a potential funding stream for our public transport improvements. The workplace parking levy fitted with that. I think the other key thing was actually workplace parking levy scheme is a much simpler scheme to administer and put in. Um, you have to remember at the time Manchester had tried to uh, go for a road user charging scheme and that went to a referendum and they got resoundingly uh, voted down. So the only place that's put in a, a, uh, a comprehensive road user charging scheme is London, but I think London is a very different city to other provincial cities. The workplace parking levy was seen as a more suitable scheme for the scale of the city and much simpler to administer, much cheaper to run. So it's a much easier scheme for a city the size of Nottingham to, to implement. I would reiterate that. I mean, I think road pricing is a difficult one to introduce. Of course, it's a charge directly on the motorist for the use of road space, which the workplace parking levy isn't. Um, and there has been a, a whole um, array of, of failed uh, attempts at trying to put a scheme in place and, and referenda don't seem to be the right way to, to go about it as you can experience, as you experienced uh, in Edinburgh going back some time, Manchester as well. So it's a difficult one and I think that the, it was, the, the workplace parking lot, although it took some, t some time to introduce, uh, was a simpler um, scheme and one that could be introduced quicker than you would have found a road pricing scheme introduced. Um, you mentioned in your evidence earlier, and it's also in your written evidence, about um, levering in other investment. For every £1 raised, it helps lever in at least another £3 of external funding. Can you explain what that extra external funding is? Yeah, so, as I said previously, in terms of, for example, the tram programme, um, we uh, basically uh, had to find about £100 million of the £500 million required for the tram uh, network, um, uh, tram extensions, obviously the other funding comes from a bit of a cocktail of different other sources but government grant is a significant part of that but basically any, any um, projects that the Department for Transport funds, uh, they like to see a local contribution and that local contribution may range from about 10% up to about 30% so the same applied to the station improvements where the, the fact that we could put in about £15 million pounds of our local money meant that we were able to lever in about another £45 million pounds of national funding right. into those improvements. So that's the kind of way that it, it works. OK. Um, and just one small uh, last question. Um, I'm finding it a bit of an anomaly um, about the, the charging of teachers to park at the workplace, given that the school is basically belongs to the local authority, the budget. So where does the charge for the school come from? Does it come from the school budgets or does the council pay the council? Uh, to some extent, the council does pay the council. If it's that, but obviously there's a lot of academies as well. So, but if that's the same for the city council. The mm. city council will contribute um, from the council to itself, but obviously that goes into then funding the transport investments. So, that money is then used for, you know, for a different purpose, isn't it? So that is true, but obviously what the council does is it then passes on those charges to the, um, to the individual. So, so those costs are covered um, by the individual. So council employees So pay. council employees do contribute. Right, okay, thank you. So that, that cost to the council is covered by the employees, that's okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. And also teachers, but uh, higher education institutions, so the two universities in Nottingham also come under the, the scheme. 
OK, I, I've got a couple of questions before we go on to some more questions from members, if I may. First of all, planning regulations used to stipulate once you built over a certain size, you had to set amount of parking spaces. Has the council changed those requirements so that if you're building buildings or working places or offices, you don't have to provide a set amount of spaces to try and discourage parking at offices? Nottingham has maximum parking standards, not minimums. So we, we actually uh, require, uh, you know, we, we put a maximum limit, not a minimum limit on our parking standards. So if, if you built above a certain square meterage, you would still be forced to, to build car parking spaces or have car parking spaces for, those spe for that square meterage? Well, it's not forced because, because it's maximums that they're, they're not allowed to provide more than a certain amount okay. of parking. OK, so I noticed in your figures you've dropped uh, on the amount of parking spaces that uh, collect working pairs parking levy from 32,000 to 25,000. 7,000 spaces have disappeared. What's happened to those spaces? I think that's, I mean, that's one of the consequences, if you like, of, of introducing a scheme that the first thing that any business that's got parking spaces is going to do is going to review what parking spaces they have yeah. and actually um, uh, only provide the spaces that they require. Now, it is important to say that it's only on spaces that, that are actually used. So if, if a business, for example, had contracted uh, and it was only using half of its car park, it only has to pay for the car parking spaces that it uses. It doesn't have to pay for the total number that are provided. OK, but I mean, uh, but, but sorry, just to clarify, you've dropped the 7,000 spaces which are no longer being charged and used, which is, yeah. I would say, is an un undeveloped area. Now, those, those spaces will, will form somebody's uh, ownership. Uh, do you encourage them to redevelop to use other uses yes, for so those spaces? Yeah, sure, and yes. is there general permitted development regulations allowed for the redevelopment, or do they have to go through the whole process again? Basically, that yes, there were, some employers have definitely redeveloped their car parks. Nottingham Trent University is probably a good example of that, where they had a number of surface car parks and they've decided that they no longer require them. It reduces their workplace parking levy uh, requirements, so they've used them for other purposes. And I think that is potentially a beneficial impact of the levy scheme that it makes um, businesses reevaluate the use of land and actually put it to better use in certain circumstances. I understand that, but that's in wide open spaces, but in, in, in more uh, central uh, cities, it's quite difficult if you throw up two spaces to find an alternative use for them, unless you're going to rent them out for car parking to other people, which are then not part of your business, could be a separate business and leased out. I mean, they, they tend to be what I call smaller car parks, sort of 50, 100 spaces, those sort of sizes that get redeveloped or, you know, then people might put an extension on their building or, you know, play things like that. So that's what, how I would say that sort of uh, companies re-evaluate the, the spaces that they have. But, yep, in fairness, I'm, I'm trying to get to the, to, the, to the smaller one. You know, if it's 11 paces you charge on, closing off one gets you out of the whole thing. That's definitely happened, you know, if people probably were on the margins of having 11 or 12, they probably, um, you know, they will have, have repurposed one, you put a bit of landscaping in or you, you repurpose it for a disabled space or an operational space. That's definitely happened and, you know, that's, that's, we accept that that's part of the scheme. Okay, so my, my final question just on that before we move back to questions is do you have any evidence to what those 7,000 spaces that have come out uh, of working place parking levy uh, have been used for and redeveloped to? I would be able to, there's definitely been examples we could show of, of where spaces have been redeveloped. I couldn't do that for the full 7,000, but I mean, it will be a combination of lar some larger car parks being redeveloped, but also then some marginal spaces just being no longer used. Yeah, some will just be redundant. And some will just be redundant, yeah. that's right. Okay. And I'm being very naughty here, but as convener, I can get away with it because I can criticise myself afterwards. Um, it's, it's just the fact that if you've got, if, if business rates are based on the property values, uh, which they are, and, and the rental values of the property, have you seen any reduction in the rental values for properties where there are large working place parking levies? 
I'm not aware, I'm not aware of that. So there's been no revaluation re by the assessor of, of those properties, or you're not aware of any significant numbers? I'm not aware of that. I don't, I, okay. I don't know. That. I don't know. Okay. We'll go back now around the committee. So uh, yeah. Richard Lyle's got one followed by Mike Rumbles. Yes. Uh, so your main bus operator is Nottingham City Transport, and that's still in public ownership. Would you agree or not agree that you have to have a good transport system in place to introduce a working parking levy. And now that this levy has been introduced in Nottingham, that it has helped you to improve your bus and tram routes and uh, make public transport better? I think it is very important to have high quality alternatives in place. I think that was something that the public demands. Um, so, I mean, uh, whether or not you have to have it all in place you know, our argument was that we had a good public transport system in place. We wanted to make it better. Um, and that was very much the reason why we have to introduce the levy. I mean, if you had an already absolutely excellent public transport system, people would probably say, why do you need to have the levy as well? But, uh, I mean, it was about that investment was very important. So you, you, have to, you have to have a good public transport in place first. That was important for Nottingham. Thank you. Uh, Mike, you are next. Very much, convenient. Can I first of all compliment you both on the evidence you've given the committee? I think it's been excellent. Uh, but I have to tell you that it's left me somewhat perplexed because you've been operating this system for seven years. It sounds good. It's very positive, the, uh, the evidence that you're given for, to, to achieve the aims of, of the exercise. But I'm still perplexed because, I'll tell you why, it goes back to my earlier question, which I, I didn't really get to the, to the bottom of, and I'd like to have another go at it. If you've been operating this system for seven years, why is it that not one single authority in England, throughout England and Wales, has copied you, has done what you're doing? Uh, because I would have thought, if it was such a prime example, that it would be people would be falling over themselves to copy it. I, th I agree with you totally. I'm, I'm perplexed as to why that hasn't been the case. Um, when this legislation came in in 2000, I, you know, but it's a case also for road pricing, because they came at the same time. You could either go for road pricing, a workplace parking levy, or in fact both. And of course, we really, well, there's one street in, uh, one road in, in, in Durham. We've had a number of attempts at trying to get a road pricing scheme in place. In, in certain parts of the country, including including Edinburgh, um, these are very difficult, very thorny uh, measures. You have to be very brave. You have to have a vision because the, you know it's not easy. You're you are actually in, implementing a disincentive. You're introducing a charge. Some would call it a tax. We've already had some uh, discussion around the table about you know fairness and all this sort of thing, which are all important issues. So you've got to be very brave. I think Nottingham were very brave. Uh, but if I, could, if I could interrupt, though, why is it? Are you saying that it's only Nottingham that's very brave? I'm not commenting on that, well, but what I, about I, all I, the I, other I, councils? If you look at the, uh, the documentation that you've been, uh, that's been circulated, there are a number of other authorities, including London Boroughs, that are, have, have gone back to it. It went very quiet after Nottingham, and I was quite surprised at that. I thought you'd find that, uh, that you know, that, that the first mover impact, but then others would look at it. Um, you know, it will happen, but you need to be, uh, you need to have a number of um, sort of things in place before that, that takes place. Uh, I don't know why. Um, maybe Chris has some reasons as to why. I mean, there's certainly been a lot of interest in Nottingham. Absolutely. You, you, I mean, you're not short of suitors and visitors. And... That's right. Lots of, lots of authorities have been and have yeah. a look and are very interested in, in taking things forward. I mean, the air quality... Um, requirements yeah. and clean air zones, which is which is basically road user charging in a, in a different uh, shape, yeah. um, is going is forcing many other local authorities now to, to go back to road pricing and yeah. maybe maybe some will consider workplace parking levy as well as part of that. So I think things are changing and and I think there's going to be much more interest in this area coming up. Okay, okay, um, Jamie Green, Jamie. Thank you, convener, for bringing me back in. Uh, gentlemen, have any businesses left Nottingham as a result of the workplace parking levy? Not, aware of. Not that we're aware of, no. no. So, um, so the report I'm reading uh, on the BBC is incorrect. 
quoting a director of a business from Nottingham who moved to Derby after the introduction of Levy, and she said, our answer was simply to move. We've been in Derby and we're very settled. Nottingham has lost what we consider to be a valuable talent pool, highly educated and intelligent people who are no longer part of the Nottingham scene. The local chambers of commerce seem to agree with that sentiment. I mean, you might, you know, you could probably find one example, but, you know, I'm, I'm not aware that there's been any kind of significant movements out of Nottingham directly because of the levy. Now, I'm not saying that the levy isn't a factor in people's uh, inward investment decisions, but public transport and the provision of the tram is a, is a factor. So, you know, different businesses have different needs and, um, you know, Lots of employers are looking to go back into cities now because of public transport accessibility. They consider that you know traffic is becoming such a big problem, congestion is a big problem. There was a lot of investment in business parks around motorway junctions, but now people find that they're completely inaccessible. Businesses want to move back into city centre locations because there are alternatives in place, and it's you know that, that, that's that's the way cities are changing and, and growing, isn't it? It's sometimes very difficult to disentangle why a company has moved. Maybe, they, maybe they, that, that's, that's, that particular reason has been given. I don't know. I don't know that particular case. Well, that I, I just, I'll just have to so. take them out on their word that that's the reason they gave publicly yeah, to the media. Yeah, 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 fine, yeah. Yeah, okay. indeed. Stuart. Um, just to pick up on that point and turn it round, what sort of businesses do you think Nottingham has a particular opportunity to attract because of the substantial investment in an excellent public transport system and the relative lack of congestion in that congestion is growing slow, more slowly than elsewhere? What kind of businesses is that going to be particularly attractive to and is there any evidence that that's actually happening in practice? I think that you're talking about sort of office-based, uh, you know, large offices are the sort of places that generally want to uh, locate themselves in city centres, headquarters, that sort of thing, regional offices. Um, obviously, places that are close to the station is attractive to people from, so they can get people further afield. I mean, a, an example of someone moving is HMRC, for example, are move, relocating a large regional office to a site very close to the station because it's got very good accessibility both within the city and from further afield. So that's the sort of employer who, who um, are going to want to invest in a high quality city, I think. Roughly how many employees is that? It's about, I think initially it's about 2,000, but there's space for 4,000, I think, in the building that they're building. So, it, 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 just to give some sense of scale, do forgive me my ignorance of Nottingham, wh roughly how many people are in employment in Nottingham? Just to give me a sense of scale. It's something like 300,000, I think, of jobs are in, in, in the conurbation of which 200,000 are in um, the city of Nottingham, I think. Is that so, the sort so, of so that's employment? roughly 1% plus increase in employment where you think this played a factor, if not being the decisive uh, matter? Well, you know, I, I, I don't know what, you know, decisions that businesses make or employers make in terms of where they locate is based on numerous factors and transport is one of them. You know, the quality of your offices is, is a factor. There's a whole host of reasons why businesses locate where they locate. Transport is one of those things. But I have to say, a, a, a relatively small freestanding city to have a, a fairly a develop, highly developed public transport system, not only the tram but the bus networks and so on and so forth, uh, can only be good for businesses thinking about where they're going to locate their premises. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to... Two more questions, then I've, I've got one myself. Richard Lyle. OK, I contend as a motorist I pay road tax, I pay petrol duty, I pay insurance. Would you not agree that the workplace park levy is an unfair tax on myself and other people as a motorist? I mean, it's not uncommon to pay parking charges and uh, many employers... But this is over and above parking charges. I, I, I get in park in a, in a car park, yes, I accept that. But this is something that's never been in place in our country and you're going to, you suggest that I, I'm going to pay it? 
No, at the moment it's very inconsistent, isn't it? Some employers will charge employees uh, to park, others don't. So at the moment you could say it's very unfair. Uh, a lot of employers basically pay a huge amount of money to, to provide car parks at no cost to the employees and it's all the people who don't drive who actually end up, you know, feel like bearing the cost of that. So actually in some ways it's a, it's a fairer, fairer system. Because in this way everybody pays and it's actually, um, it provides money to uh, encourage behaviour change into more sustainable forms of transport which is actually beneficial for everybody. But you could just say to me, let's put your, your, your uh, income tax up by 10 pence, Mr Lyle. Shouldn't you? Couldn't you? You could do that, but, but then um, this, this is all about, you could almost describe this sort of nudge kind of economics, isn't it? It's about providing small changes to encourage a behaviour change. And that, that's what this sort of fits into. Thank you. I'm not sure whether from that Richard's moving to Nottingham to work or, or, or not, but uh, <laughs> lovely city, it's a lovely, a lovely city and, and tell the, the mayor and other members that I was asking for them. So he might be coming. Uh, Maureen, you, you get uh, another question. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, if we look at business rates, um, offices certainly in Scotland will have business rates on the buildings and then they might have a separate business rate for their car parking spaces. Is that the same in Nottingham? And then is the workplace parking levy on top of that? Or did you take away the car parking spaces business rates uh, bit? I think, I think there is a component that relates to parking included in the business rate. I think, I think that's good. I'm not, I'm not an expert on business rates. Um, obviously, the workplace parking levy is additional to business rates, but obviously there is the potential that you can pass that charge on to employees. And for example, an employer could make a profit out of the charges that they um, uh, pass on, and they can raise more money by passing it on than, than the, the, the levy is charged. So for that, again, that's a uh, decision for the individual employer. Okay, thank you. I, I think that was it was a line of questioning which which I I was keen to take up again. Just to, my understanding of, of business rates is based on the rateable value of the uh, the rental value of the building, which would include the car parking spaces. Therefore, if there was a car parking levy as a tenant of a building, I would I would personally argue um, that my rental would be too high and would have to come down by the rental. Uh, the value of the car parking charge. It's the question I sort of asked you earlier, and, and you didn't, you suggested that there'd be no change to uh, business rates or reassessments in, in Nottingham. It, it, are you still convinced that's correct? I'm not aware of that. I mean, that's something I might have to check. I, I can check the details of that. I, I'm not aware of that, but I, I'm perfectly happy to go away and check that. Okay. I just have another question, just. Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure if you said that you, you had the choice between congestion charging, low emission zones, or working place parking levy, and you plumped for working place parking levy because you thought it was better than the other two. Is that what you said? Or do you, or, or do you think all three of them could be imposed at the same time? So you could have a congestion charge, a low emission zone, which uh, is currently being suggested might be a penalty charge if you don't meet the requirement and a working place parking levy so you could get taxed three times if that's what city decided to go for do you think that's a way forward uh, well in theory that is that you could do that but i mean why as a council you'd want to go that i mean you'd be creating a very complicated and a very expensive mechanism um to do all that I mean, what I, what I was saying is, at the time, in 2012, the options were between workplace parking levy and a road user charging scheme, similar to what they've got in London. Since then, obviously, the government has introduced uh, the concept of clean air zones, um, which is specifically a, a designed to address the air quality issue, and that has come in subsequently. I think we, when we were looking at the implications of air quality, we were not keen to go down the route of having both a clean air zone and a workplace parking levy. I think um, that would be quite complicated and you, you, know, you do run that risk of having double charges. But obviously, the workplace parking levy is only aimed at private car journeys, uh, whereas a, a, 
clean air zone can tackle other um, uh, modes such as buses, taxis, vans, for example, and you don't have to necessarily include cars within that. So you could make those two schemes work together, but I think you do have to think carefully about how they do, and you wouldn't want the same people paying twice, I don't think. I don't uh, think that would be advantageous. Particularly. Okay, Chris, I'm going to push you just on that. So your advice for a city that was considering a scheme, they should choose working place parking levy, congestion zones, or low emission zones, but not combine all three. I think it would be almost impossible to get all three in place. Uh, the, the road pricing has a long, long history. Okay. Um, you could fill your room full of papers that have been written on road pricing. It's a very difficult one to get into place, as you well know. And uh, I think there are very few schemes around the world. Um, and, but there is a lot of um, benefits of a road pricing scheme because you're charging directly for the use of road space and can charge where congestion is. Um, whereas with, with the workplace parking level, you're charging where vehicles terminate and uh, therefore it's a complementary measure. Um, could you get both? I think it would be very difficult even for the most stable political um, council to get both of those in place at the same time. Okay, so, so it, it, it's one or the other, I think, is what you're saying. I think that, that neatly brings us to the end of our time as well. So, uh, Chris and Stephen, thank you very much for, for giving thank evidence. You. And um, it's been extremely useful um, and, and extremely clear, if I may be so bold as to say, not only in, in what you've said, but also in the reception we've received on, on the monitors. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'd briefly now like to suspend the meeting to give... Uh, members five minutes uh, before the next session. Thank you.
Okay, good. Good morning. I'd like to reconvene the, the meeting. Uh, this is our second panel session on um, the workplace parking levy as part of the transport bill. And I'd like to welcome, first of all, Pauline McNeil, who joined the committee um, for, for this session. I would also like to welcome Jim Grieve, the uh, Interim Partnership Director of Sestran, a member of the Society of Chief Officers of Transportation Scotland. Councillor Anna Richardson, the City Convener for Sustainability and Carbon Reduction for Glasgow City Council, and Richard Sweetnam, the Chief Officer for City Growth for Aberdeen, uh, Aberdeen Council, City Council. Um, now, there are a series of questions, and what I thought we'd do, uh, if for those of you that saw the previous one, is allow members a certain amount of time to manage their own time to ask their questions, and then do some more questions at the end. And so, without further ado, I think we're into the first question, which is John Finney. John. Hey, thank you, Convener. Ed, good morning, panel. I have two questions, both very simple questions. And uh, first and foremost, can you say whether uh, you support the proposal to allow local authorities, acting individually or indeed in partnership with other local authorities, to introduce a workplace parking levy? And can you s explain why, if you do support, or why you oppose it, please? John, you're in charge. You better ask who you want to answer first. Who, who's Mr. Grieve, you, you look sort of... happy to answer first. Um, as a regional uh, transport partnership um, covering uh, the southeast of, of Scotland, including the city of Edinburgh, uh, and also as a Scots representative, um, I'm happy to say that we do uh, support the principle of a workplace parking levy. However, from the RTP perspective, um, we have concerns that there should really be a regional perspective over such an introduction um, due to the issue which I think was raised earlier by Mr Smith in, in speaking to, to Nottingham, um, the potential for disadvantages to fall in neighbouring councils uh, with all the advantages potentially within, within the city. So there is that concern but broadly we are in, certainly in favour of it as a tool essentially for, for use um, in a discretionary way by an authority, be that a, a local authority or indeed a regional transport partnership. C can I maybe just uh, quickly just say, uh, would you acknowledge, Mr. Reeve, that there's nothing in the amendment that would preclude local authorities working collaboratively? Indeed, one authority having a scheme which had implications for, for instance, a park and ride in another local authority area. I do acknowledge that. And I, I did read that element. Um, but when we already have um, local authority partnerships established, then there is a vehicle there already uh, to actually look at that in a combined way and ensure consistency if indeed more than one authority is looking at such an introduction at a, at a, at a similar time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Archer. Yeah, Glasgow City Council does support the principle of this power being passed to local authorities and that was passed with a strong majority by committee back in December of last year. The main reason that we support this power coming to local authorities is because we're in the process of writing a new local transport strategy for the city and we're keen to have as many powers at our disposal as possible eh, so that we've got as wide a toolkit as possible eh, to explore all the options and to come up with the best strategy for our city. And, and just to clarify, you view that as being an option, not necessarily one that you'd put in place straight away? At the moment, it's an option. We haven't done the analysis and the work that we'd need to do to decide whether we are in favour of implementing the policy itself. That work would come once we knew that we had that power available to us. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sweet. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> a very similar um, um, conclusion. Aberdeen City Council, along with the <clears throat> other Scottish cities through Empowering City um, Government, looked at powers to drive inclusive economic growth. Um, and there were many levers in that, including um, um, levies. But its position is that once the powers are devolved and there is the legislative ability to, to implement such levers, then the debate and the analysis and the decisions can be made in response to the local um, need. Okay, thank you very much. Can, can I also ask you about consultation connected with this? Because it is a, the proposal is to give the power to local authorities, but there's a requirement for consultation. Do you think that's robust enough consultation? or if there, Do you have any concerns about the proposal? From, a, <clears throat> from an officer point of view, um, th there's obviously been quite a quick turnaround in terms of, of the response time. So I, I think you know, further consideration is certainly needed in terms of the, the costs and benefits of, of any such scheme. Um, to date, it's been quite a quick turnaround in terms of response time and, and therefore consultation at, at the local level. Okay, thank you. 
we'd be absolutely committed to doing as much consultation as possible as we develop the local transport strategy. And with uh, a scheme such as a workplace parking levy, it's absolutely critical that we feed in everybody's views. Um, if I could use a, an example of, for example, our low emission zone in Glasgow, we have put consultation at the heart of that policy development. We uh, have done huge uh, amounts of engagement with particular groups, whether that's particular business groups, whether that's taxis, whether that's specific representative organisations. And we feel that that's a really important way to make policy alongside those who will be affected by it and to build in mitigation throughout the policy development rather than being in a position where we consult on a completed policy and then have to perhaps um, amend at that stage. So certainly if we uh, go forward and, and have this power as a local authority, we would be having those conversations with uh, people across the board in the city, with all stakeholders throughout the process. And possibly across authorities, oh. Councillor Sean? John, you, you are cutting into other people's oh, time quite, pardon, then. quite okay. considerably. Yeah. Uh, and Anna, you missed at the beginning, I, I did say that uh, what, what, what to try and attract your attention when time was running short, I, I'd wag on my pen. And the, the fear is always that if I get too vigorous with it, it flies in, in your direction. Um, but but uh, Jim, could I ask you to answer that question very briefly? And then we're going to have to ask to, to move on the, the, the one that everyone else answered. Thank you, convener. Yes, again, I, I would go back to the regional perspective. Um, a fundamental duty of the RTP is to provide a regional transport strategy. And uh, our suggestion is that initiatives such as, as a WPL should be part of that uh, process, which does uh, carry with it a very wide stakeholder engagement and consultation. OK, thank you very much. OK, um, the next question is from John Mason. John. Thank you, Convener. Um, I asked the Nottingham people about the kind of finances of all of this, and I think they did 50 million had come in over five years, and then that had gone to the specific purposes of tram and bus and the rail station. I can I ask what your thinking is that if you did have these monies coming in, would they be ring fenced, or, or how would you deal with them? In terms of what we do with the money, I think the amendment's quite clear that the expectation is that it would be ring-fenced, and that's absolutely an approach that we would wish to take. Uh, in terms of what projects it would be uh, designed for, we would have to make uh, that prioritisation based on what the local transport strategy selects as the key priorities for the city, but clearly sustainable transport, so cycling, walking and public transport. Right. I mean, well, can I maybe just press you on that one as well? I mean, Nottingham were seem to have uh, levered in quite a lot of extra money because they'd got that 50 million and I think they'd ended up spending about 600 million or something because they were kind of matching and then other people were giving them money. Would you anticipate that if you had the money coming in like that, the same would apply in Glasgow or Aberdeen or Edinburgh? Absolutely, and that's the approach that we take when levering in um, additional funds, for example, from the Scottish Government. We're very clear about where we match things from. Thank you. Yes. Um We've got about 7,000 employer parking spaces in, in the city council boundary, so any proceeds from that that were ring fenced for transport measures would be fairly insignificant. I think the Nottingham um, evidence shows that £400 million of investment came in from the Department for Transport in the, in the tram scheme, so it, it, it's one part of a, a much wider package. Mr Grief. Um, Again, I suppose a, a word of caution, the, the, this kind of approach where, for example, uh, government just now uh, has £80 million available this year for, for active travel. It's much increased from, from previous years. It applied last year as well. And much of that money requires a match from a council or indeed an RTP. Um, if a council is able to earn additional money, say from a WPL, uh, then they have more money available to match what they might gain from, from the Scottish government. Smaller councils that don't have that facility or don't have the, um, the, the concentration, concentration of traffic that would demand a, a WPL situation um, could potentially lose out in attracting additional funds into that council for things like active travel. Which would be an argument for doing things more on an RTP basis. Indeed. D does the legislation need, does the bill need changing a, to underline that? Well, the, the bill... At the moment, and I think this applies generally for, for all of the items in there, uh, LEZs, etc., is purely focused on local authorities having the powers. And would you favour then changing that a bit? I would. You would, right? Yes. Okay, I'll leave it to that now. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Uh, Peter, Peter Chapman. Um, just before I go into my, uh, my question, I would, I would ask uh, Mr. Sweetman, Sweetnam to 
clarify, because I was under the impression that the Aberdeen City Council had come out against, in principle, support in this workplace park and living. That's, that's not what you said to the previous question. To, to, to clarify for, for the committee, I'm, I'm an officer of the council, so the council hasn't made any decision in terms of um, th this um, levy. What the council did do in 2016 was approve the Scottish Cities Alliance framework of powers and levers in and around city um, driving economic growth, and, and the parking levy was one such lever. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the council's position is that if the powers are devolved to councils to make these decisions, then it will look at this lever along with um, others. So the council hasn't um, discussed or debated or made any decision in relation to an employer levy, uh, par a workplace parking levy. Right, and thanks for cl clarifying that, because that, that's nearer where I think the, the well, certainly the leader of the Aberdeen City Council has, has, uh, has made statements to the effect that he didn't think this was a, a good way to go. So we'll leave that there. I mean, um, my question is really is how could you, how could you well, to, the, to the three of you really, how can you ensure or assess that any workplace parking levy doesn't have a negative impact on inward investment or business development or indeed businesses deciding to exit the, your city uh, totally? I mean, how can you assess that? Or what's, your, what's your feeling as to what kind of effect that might have? I, I think the analysis of the costs and the benefits ex ante would, would need to be done. From an Aberdeen perspective, um, th there's also the with AWPR scenario that would need to be considered in terms of, of movements um, of, of vehicles in and out of the city. Um, from, I, I, I guess, without speculating on, on your, your point about um, investment um, changes, it's worth bearing in mind that um, the, the Aberdeen city economy is driven by about 50 to 70,000 um, daily movements of people into work into the city. So the rural hinterlands of, of, of um, Aberdeen, Shire, Angus and Murray are, are really important from an economic development perspective. So that would need to be included in, in the analysis and I guess its impact in terms of businesses and who pays and how it's accounted for in the administration. All of that would need to feed into the analysis as well to look at the effect of any levy um, on, on the business um, community. I mean, you make the point, and I, I totally agree, that much of the, if the city, if Aberdeen City went down this road and started charging, many of the people that would be paying the, the charge are from, from other rural uh, authorities, you know, Aberdeen and, 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 and uh, Angus, as you, as you rightly say. Many people from uh, the, these authorities would actually be paying the charge, and yet the, the, the money would come to Aberdeen City. Subject to who, who pays if it's an employer or, an, or how the employer passes on, I think these are all things that the um, analysis and the consultation would need to look at. Mm. Anna, what's your thoughts on the original question? Uh, certainly, um, we're doing a lot of work to make Glasgow as uh, as appealing for inward investment as possible. I think we've shown that uh, we do bring uh, big investments in, but one of the things that we can do is to improve the transport network uh, further, and that's where having uh, ring fence money, such as a workplace parking levy, would be just one tool amongst many that would enable us to make the city even more appealing to employers that are coming in. And I felt very heartened listening to Nottingham's experience uh, that it certainly is uh, a place that appears to be thriving um, from everything that they've put into their evidence. Mm. Okay, Jim? Uh, I think um, in terms of trying to ensure that you don't lose business, the, the approach to the whole issue is, is fundamental. Um, it has to be part of a, a strategy, uh, so you, you're able to illustrate what the potential advantages are from, from the income that may uh, ensue from, from such a, an introduction. Um, and hopefully through a con consultation process that describes the potential advantages in the longer term um, would, would help to ensure that you can take people with you and not not chase people away from, from the city. Mm. I mean, I, 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 just, I just throw in one example. I have, I have spoken to a major employer in, in Aberdeenshire uh, who has an, uh, several hundred parking spaces, and he says, if this comes in, I would seriously consider moving my business. You know, that, that was his um, immediate reaction. And, you know, this is just a step too far. So I, I'll throw that in. I don't know if any of you want to comment, but... Uh, just a, a general comment. Um, if you ask somebody um, to pay for something that they previously didn't pay for, 
as, as abruptly as that, then you're not going to get a good reaction. Mm. And I think Edinburgh actually suffered from that in terms of the congestion charge some years back. But as, as I said earlier, if, if you're able to describe it in, in the context of a bigger picture, of a bigger strategy, and of potential advantages at the, at the far end of this process, then the chances of success are, are much higher. Okay. I'll leave it there. Peter, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on. Uh, if you want to come back in afterwards, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity. Uh, Richard Lyle, Richard. Yes. I've got four minutes, I've got four questions that I want. And, and Jim Greave, you uh, took my first question. Uh, should the introduction of this proposal not be put locally to residents in a referendum similar to what happened in Edinburgh? Yeah. yeah. Yes. I, I, I don't need anybody else to think. <laughs> so, um, uh, Councillor Anna Richardson, how much does Glasgow raise presently in parking charges? And would you not agree that this would also give you millions of pounds extra funding? I don't have that data to hand. I don't have that with me. But certainly it is revenue that comes in and we do uh, spend that Would you agree that, that Glasgow for... actually physically at this moment in time raise millions of pounds in parking charges? We do have a sense. That's all I need to know. Um, would you, uh, Richard uh, Sweetnam, can you, would you agree that the workplace parking levy, to your mind, is an extra tax on motorists who pay uh, petrol, car duty, uh, car tax, tyres, um, insurance, running cost servicing. So you're going to ask me to pay, as a motorist, you're going to ask me to pay an extra car tax. I think it depends who pays. If we look at evidence from, if, if the policy driver is, say, for example, uh, low carbon, low emissions, if we look at evidence from Norway, the lever it used was to wave VAT on low emission vehicles. So I think there's different um, ways of doing this. Um, but, uh, you know, currently, if, if, um, if, if employees need to park in the city centre, it's not unusual that they pay in some way. Right, the one question to all, sorry I've rattled through, but uh, sometimes the, the can either stops me in mid-flight. Um, exemptions. I've had emails from police officers, people from Glasgow Airport, people, teachers, you know, so if we're going to exempt NHS, which I, I agree, but in the two hospitals that are in, uh, are in the region I stay in, uh, the car parking's exempt, so, uh, and, and staff park there. But a police officer has to go in and park and say, Govan, and, and uh, the email from one officer said, if I have to park outside, the, the people will target my car. Teachers go to school every day and do a wonderful job. I compliment each and every one of them. But they park locally at the school and have designated car parks. So should we not exempt police officers, teachers, and other people that we think should be exempt? Each of you. Richard, Richard, I, I know why you didn't look at me at that time because I think this was an area that Jamie Green wanted to explore. But, but, but please, yeah. please. Uh, no, well, I, I said I please, want to come in on that. Please, too. please answer individually and across as quickly as you can who should be in the exemptions. I think the exemptions are one of the specifics that um, will be up to local authorities to determine. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to um, agree or disagree a list of what they should be on a hypothetical policy that at the moment we haven't had a robust debate on uh, democratically. So I won't, um, I won't make any commitments today, but I will commit that certainly those are the types of conversations we need to have through the consultation process. And, um, as a starter, I would suggest perhaps limiting the time of the workplace parking charge um, so that shift workers perhaps would be exempt. That would be a starter without naming specific um, professions. I, I mean, I think we, we need to look at the, the analysis in more detail. Um, all, all I would say is that the, the more exemptions you have, we've got to also think of the administrative burden in terms of the cost of running the scheme. But, but um, sure, exemptions would need to be looked at where relevant. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jamie, um, do you have a question? I'm spuriously <laughs> trying to make up a question there. Thank you, convener. Um, I'll, I'll maybe um, touch on some different areas, and, and perhaps with uh, your permission, I can come back at the end if anything jumps to mind. Um, uh, do you think that a, a levy such as this disproportionately uh, affects small and medium-sized businesses? And I appreciate there may be, uh, as is, was the case in Nottingham, exemptions for very small businesses with limited number of parking spaces. 
but it's those perhaps in the middle who are uh, perhaps least li uh, most likely to be affected by uh, the charge and most likely to want to pass that charge on to their employees rather than sink it into their operating costs. Analysis on that at the moment. That's not a piece of work that we've done at this point, so I wouldn't be able to comment on exactly who would be affected the most. Anybody else? I'm without, uh, you know, as I said earlier, Aberdeen hasn't undertaken any consultation, but I, I'd anticipate that the business response would um, be well, how is this levied? How is it administered? Who pays? And in the context of other um, tax, non-domestic rates and, and, and so forth. So um, that, that's what I would anticipate would be the response. I think from an Aberdeen perspective, the reality is that um, it, it's a, an incredibly strong private sector city, about nine, jo nine private sector jobs for every 10 working age people. So I think that consultation with employers is absolutely key. Anything to add, Mr. Just a, a brief... Uh, a brief comment. I think much depends on the charge, which you know that in itself would be quite a difficult thing to establish. And, and in my view, it would depend on what the council or the authority is trying to achieve. Is it to reduce congestion and, and, and reduce pollution, or is it to make money? Um, the level of charge at say 400, similar to Nottingham, um, if if you're earning a reasonable sum of money, that is not a huge sum of money to, to pay to park your car for a, for a year's travel to work by car. Um, and for a medium-sized company, that's something they may choose to distribute to their employees. Mm -hmm. And proportionately, it's not a major cost. Um, so I think the, the whole response will very much depend on the kind of charges that are being talked about and what the, what the purpose of the workplace parking charge would be. So on that note then, uh, what, I mean, what does it mean to you as a city? What, what do you think the purpose of a workplace parking levy fundamentally is, because we heard from Nottingham, it seemed very much the narrative was that it was a, a, a revenue-raising yeah. opportunity, uh, which is why perhaps they chose to operate that rather than a congestion scheme, rather than a low emission zone. Now, each year cities are considering low emission zones. The evidence we heard perhaps suggested that it wouldn't be wise to operate those and the workplace parking levy, and that was Nottingham's view. So what do you think is the point, uh, what would the point be of a levy in your city? In terms of having the low emission zone, which is already operating in Glasgow, it's slightly different to the clean air zones that are the, the English model that Nottingham would be working under. Uh, under the clean air zones, they seem to be doing more of a daily charge to go into the cities, whereas the low emission zone is a penalty notice. So we would be, um, by 2022, would be expecting uh, no vehicles that are uh, not clean enough to be coming into the city. And that's quite a different model uh, to the model of having a workplace parking levy, which is a charge, um, but is still um, enabling those vehicles to to come in and out as they wish. Uh, for Glasgow, uh, we have got a very clear strategic plan priority to prioritise sustainable transport. Uh, that's what our local transport strategy will be aiming to achieve. That will be done through encouraging modal shift, reducing congestion to enable public transport to move more quickly and easily. Uh, and of course, that will complement the air quality work that's already going on. Yes, from, a, from an Aberdeen perspective, the, the policy drivers are, are key. The city centre master plan, the regional economic strategy, hydrogen Aberdeen, the oil and gas UK's own vision 2035, and of course transport strategies, all of them speak about low carbon, low emissions, um, and, and energy transition. So um, the policy framework is, is clear, but obviously the objectives of any scheme would need to align to that. I, sorry, I, heard, I, heard, I hear lots of words, but I still haven't really got any sense of what you think the levy's for. Is it to raise revenues? Is it to reduce congestion? Is it to improve air quality or all of the above? Well, from an Aberdeen perspective, it hasn't sort of developed a scheme and therefore its objectives, but um, the, the existing policy framework is very clear in terms of low carbon agendas, um, whereas a Nottingham one might have been a, a, a congestion charging perspective. Do you want to answer that briefly because I'd like to, to push on with the next question as well? Yeah, I think uh, Glasgow City Council are looking to decarbonise as rapidly as possible to improve our air quality and to improve people's health uh, and to reduce congestion in our city. And I think all of those are achieved through very similar policy drivers. But of course, one tool can achieve all of that. It has to work in synergy through a strategy. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question is from Colin. Colin. 
Thanks very much, Convener. Can I come back to the point um, raised earlier about the fact this is a local authority charge, it's not a regional charge, and, and the practical implication of this, because we have an economic system that drives all the jobs into the most congested cities in Scotland, uh, lots of people cannot afford to live in the centre of Edinburgh, for example, so they may live elsewhere, they may choose rightly to live in a wonderful part of the world called the south of Scotland, in the borders, Midlothian, but they travel into Edinburgh every day for work. Isn't the case that this proposal will mean that not, none of those constituents of mine will have a say on a workplace parking levy in Edinburgh? They will have to pay that charge if they go into Edinburgh, but not a single penny raised from that charge will be spent on transport in the borders or Midlothian. Is that not the practical implication of this? And likewise, not just Edinburgh and Glasgow as well. My constituents from Dumfries and Galloway will travel into Glasgow, uh, and maybe Councillor Richard can tell me what advantage it will be to them in terms of public transport in, say, Dumfries and Galloway of a parking levy in Glasgow. Yeah, I think we need to look at these things regionally. Uh, I'm very clear that Glasgow City cannot thrive without the areas around it that enable us to have that wide travel to work area. So certainly any benefits that come into Glasgow will enable us to offer a better transport network throughout Glasgow. Uh, we have to maintain a significant road network within the city, which a lot of, of which has to be funded through uh, local authority uh, revenue and capital. So certainly any further income that can come in, any revenue that comes in to enable us to uh, make it easier for people to move well around the city for those who come in from wherever in the region into Glasgow are then able to move around that city with less congestion. Uh, conversations that were happening in the previous evidence session around Nottingham looking at park and ride and other ways for um, people to move from further out the city perhaps doing a, a multimodal journey. Uh, those are the types of conversations we need to have on a regional level uh, and I think that's a very important part of this conversation. Um, it's just important in terms of if there was a scheme um, and, and assuming there is a, a reliable alternative in terms of, of public transport, but the benefits um, of investing in a tram network in, in, for example, Nottingham, I guess the, the benefits to people in the hinterland is reliability in terms of journey time, time savings, efficiency, and so forth. So, so the actual investment doesn't necessarily need to accrue in the hinterland to, for, for people to benefit. So, so, so can I just come back on that point that, 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 that what you're saying is that what the, the areas that will have the biggest challenge getting public transport are in those rural areas where we're seeing bus services being cut. Not a single penny of this workplace levy will be spent on a single transport initiative within the areas or with the cities. That's a fact. You're saying that, um, uh, that, that, that's, that would be the case. So bus services at the borders would not be improved because there'd be no money raised for the borders. So public transport, which is what we're supposed to be saying should be improved, will not be improved as a result of a city-based scheme. Isn't that the fact? No, that's Jim come in, yeah, just because yeah. he, he was waiting very patiently before Colin Sorry. came back to you. The, there's a, a comment on, the, on the, the SPICE report that was prepared um, for, for the committee that said, um, largest financial impact on the lowest paid car commuters it is a potential concern. So I, I share the concerns that, that you're raising. Um, and again, it goes back to the need to incorporate this within an overall strategy so that the investment goes equitably um, around a city, not just within a city. But in, in my view, you're right in what you're saying, and the legislation, as it's currently proposed, would confine potentially everything to one, one authority. And just, just the final point, and that would be made worse by the proposals from Glasgow City Council that would extend this not just to park and to get to your work, but any visitors to the, to, the, to the city from my constituency who want to go to shopping centres, supermarkets, anything else within Glasgow because you propose um, to not have a workplace parking levy, we'd like to see that extended to all parking, non-residential parking, so that would actually have a double impact in those people out with the area. Would that be the case? Colin, you're, you're very good at looking the other way when I'm trying to catch your eye to tell you your time is up. So, Anna, you can answer that very briefly and then we're going to have to move on to the next question. And don't... Don't stop looking at me while you're answering it. <laughs> um, 
You're absolutely right. The committee paper that was put forward in December, we suggested that the power should be for non-residential parking levies rather than workplace parking levy. Uh, that doesn't mean we're necessarily in favour of that. It means that we wanted to explore those options and we felt that would perhaps make the scheme of interest to other local authorities that perhaps don't have such a, a strong travel to work situation that Glasgow does. Okay. We are, I'm sorry, just in fairness, I'm, I'm trying to get as many questions in as possible. Mike, uh, yours is the next question. Th th thank you, convener. Now, it's obvious from what you've said, if not all the other evidence, that councils would like, obviously, isn't it, to have as many powers as they, they, can, they can have. Uh, that's quite a different issue from councils using them. So if I go back to the question I was asking the previous panel, in 2000, 19 years ago, Westminster passed legislation to give local authorities throughout England and Wales the ability to do this. And we've had one council throughout the entire councils of England and Wales take this up. So if this bill passed with this amendment in it, do you think it would be different in Scotland? Mike, it's you, it's you to ask who you want to answer. Well, I would like an answer from all three. Okay. Jim, could you start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it depends on, on what any given authority uh, intends to do or what, what they want to achieve. And for example, um, if they want to reduce congestion and, and clean the air within, a, within an authority, my suggestion would be to go for an LEZ. Uh, the workplace parking levy, again, in my view, is, I think, a potential to bring in additional revenue and invest in public transport, all of which it, and, uh, makes sense, um, but it does very much depend on what the authority is trying to achieve. But, but could I also ask why you think, from, you, from your perspective, why you think nobody in England and Wales is apart from London has <laughs> taken this up? That's a very difficult one to answer. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's very difficult to get, to get over the line. Um, Nottingham succeeded. I don't know if, if any others have actually tried and, and failed to get it over the line. Um, so, sorry, but I just can't speculate on that one, really. I'd suggest that one of the things that should bring comfort to the committee is that um, before this power has even gone forward, cities such as Glasgow have said that they would like to explore this further. So that's not committing to using the power, but it's showing a very keen interest in considering the power and exploring whether it would be feasible. But, but isn't that my point? That no council, no council is going to turn around and say, oh, no, we don't want this power uh, from, from our legislation, legislators here. So we have to decide... Is no, Am I right? No council would say, oh, we don't want the power. That doesn't mean to say they're going to use it. You, you've just basically said that, isn't it? I can't speak for what other councils might or might not do, but from Glasgow, we've made a very clear case that we are working on our transport strategy. And as part of that, we would like to be able to explore okay. workplace parking levy. I, I can't be any more strong in my commitment uh, in terms of what Glasgow City Council has said so far, but certainly we would explore it. And if it was appropriate, then we would bring forward okay. um, proposals either for or against yeah, I, I think Aberdeen's position is, is um, similar in the sense that um, it's the power and whether it's used or not is, is, is up to the council to, to decide. Um, an observation I would make is that as, as part of the Aberdeen City Council's bond issue, it, it, um, supporting that is the work of the Aberdeen Economic Policy Panel, an independent panel of economists, um, and, and they, in their first report, had made the observation that actually if you're trying to um, drive economic growth locally and regional, then you do need these powers. And, and so that remains the position. How they're used is, is up, of course, but, but for the, have you for the any council to why decide. Nobody else in, in England is using, has used them in 19 years? I, I guess there's, there's also a, a shift in context in terms of, of the, the, the work done in 2012 in Nottingham and, and now in terms of things like low emission um, agendas, low carbon agendas as well. But, to come in and say he wants to lead, just a, lead this. Just a, no, just a very brief comment. Um, what you're getting at is another tool in the box uh, available to whoever. I think my concern is that currently these tools will only be available to local authorities individually. But it's a tool in the box. But it's it's all very well having tools in the box if you don't use them. <laughs> um, my, I'm afraid we're going to have to move, move on to uh, the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Gail. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, Anna, you have already stated, and quite rightly so, that you can speak on behalf of other local authorities. I completely understand that. So, uh, Jim, this is all going to be on you, I think. Um, in rural areas, people have already expressed a concern that 
Um, a workplace parking levy is only really going to work if you have excellent public transport links. And as uh, Colin Smith has already stated, um, in certain rural areas, our, our public transport links um, could be improved, shall we say. Um, do you think it might be likely for a council such as the Highland Council that covers both an urban city and a rural area that they might decide to implement it in Inverness only? Could you see that working? <laughs> Again, I'm speculating, it's purely, purely an opinion. Um, there's a, there's a nationwide problem with rural bus services, as we're all aware. In fact, there's a, a wider problem with bus services in that nationally there is dec declining bus patronage. And anything that, any initiatives that come in place that can start to reverse that is, is a positive thing for, for sustainable transport. Um, but I, there's, there's no one size fits all, and the Highland area is, is, is unique in, in many ways. Um, and it's hard to imagine looking at something within the city of Inverness um, and being confined to that city that will have any benefit to the surrounding rural areas. So again, it would, the, the thing would have to be approached on a, a wider level than within the city itself. Um, I mean, there was a reference to park and rides earlier from, from, uh, uh, from Nottingham, and that's, you know, that's certainly a very valid tool to try and intercept uh, vehicles as they come towards the city and then get them onto sustainable transport or, or, or even active travel. Um, so again, the whole, it has to be, the whole initiative would have to be looked at as a much bigger picture. I think that's really what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. You can't really just confine the thought to say a workplace parking charge to try and solve a problem within one particular city. Mm -hmm. the, the bigger picture is really what you need to look at. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation in rural areas, I think. The investment needs to go into the public transport system, but the money that's raised from the congest from the workplace parking levy, you know, which comes first, obviously the investment has to come first. Um, Anna, in your paper, um, you you submitted it says uh, policy and resource implications, and you've got financial implications. None at this stage. Um, does does Glasgow City Council envisage a uh, um, big investment in, in public transport if you were to introduce this or do you think that the public transport system at the moment is sufficient to provide for, for a workplace parking? Yeah, in terms of the no financial resources, to clarify, that was just the paper that was asking for the powers. Uh, that's why it had no resource. Um, any analysis that's been done up to now has been done within existing staffing resources. Uh, in terms of our public transport, I think what uh, Nottingham said was uh, very helpful. They said they had a good public transport system, but it had to be better. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly our aspiration for Glasgow is that it has to become much better. We're doing that already. We're not waiting for any future powers. We're working much more closely with the bus operators. We're investing huge amounts of money into walking and cycling infrastructure. Uh, clearly but we have the suburban rail and the underground as well so we have the beginnings of, of a, a very good system but we do have much higher aspirations for it uh, and having a power such as the workplace parking levy would just be another tool that would perhaps be one that uh, we could use ring fence funds uh, for uh, to, to make even greater investments or more importantly to match in even bigger more significant amounts of money. Um, maybe Richard wants to reply on behalf of Aberdeen. Just, uh, I think Jim used the... Uh, That's very delicately done to ignore the fact that I'd whispered to her that her time was up. <laughs> Richard, you I, can I, come I in briefly Jim, so thank you, I can then bring thank in... You, Jim, Jim used the, the phrase two in the box, <laughs> I, I guess, and, and I'm fortunate to, to live and work in a, in a city region that includes a, a significant rural hinterland. Um, the need for connectivity is absolutely key to attract and retain talent and those infrastructure projects still remain, um, road, rail connectivity, um, journey times between Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire and the central belt. So, so that is absolutely still an important issue and indeed a vital part of the city region deal. Okay, uh, Maureen. Convener. Um, and I think I'm right in having picked you up and saying this paper that you've submitted as part of your written evidence, it was a paper that was discussed in December. Was that by a committee or by the full council? Committee. By committee. So at least any pronouncements coming from Glasgow City are a result of the discussion of the paper uh, by uh, the transport 
committee. Um, in terms of Aberdeen, and perhaps Jim, you could uh, talk in terms of Edinburgh, have there been similar papers put to Aberdeen City Council and Edinburgh City Council, or are any pronouncements so far just the views of those that have been uh, asked for them? So on the WPL uh, itself, there's been no committee paper. The Council did, as I said earlier, look at the framework for powers and levers on the work done by the Scottish Cities Alliance in 2016, and that was approved as a framework from which to develop the discussion on devolution of powers. In terms of uh, Edinburgh, uh, they actually submitted some written evidence to, to, to the committee, and, and they are clearly in favour of the option of workplace uh, parking levies. They, they are currently looking at uh, a low emission zone consulting on that and on what they call the city centre transformation which is removing cars from the from the city centre so they are pursuing these two initiatives in, in parallel um, but not yet a, a WPL. Okay thank you. Um, Anna can I ask you um, you've called for the introduction of a, a wide-ranging non-residential parking levy I wonder if you could explain um, that a bit more and why you think it's preferable to a proposed working, par working work WPL. And also, um, we clearly heard from Nottingham this morning that good, uh, absolutely essential to the working of this is a good public transport system that's essential, as well as good parking ride. Now, we've heard of the aspirations of Glasgow City Council. Um, can the others tell us, you know, what they think, what, you know, what they would if they were going to use the WPL, what they are, are putting in place in order, or would put in place in order to make it work. In terms of the committee paper, this came forward before this amendment was up for discussion, and our consideration of non-residential parking levy was simply because if a power was to be asked for, um, we felt it was appropriate to ask for the widest possible power to give the most local flexibility, not just to cities with a, a significant travel to work area like Glasgow, but perhaps other local authorities that have um, issues where they would like to um, deprioritise uh, private car use, but not in a commuting perspective, perhaps they had other um, considerations and on a regional uh, wide um, model that also might be something uh, that would be more useful to certain local authorities even within our own travel to work area. So we were putting forward this paper not to express a preference to do WPL or non-residential parking levy but simply to ask for as wide a, a ranging power as possible to enable us to do the fullest possible analysis of what would be the best option for Glasgow. Okay, do the others want to come in before I come back? Maybe just a comment in, in, in respect of Edinburgh and actually into the Lothians. The Lothian buses provide what is regarded as an excellent bus service um, and one of the best nationally. So that's a big advantage for the, for the urban area surrounding the city. However, the further out you go, um, the less efficient uh, are the bus services. So that's an issue that will have to be looked at as, as part of the initiatives that are being pursued. And uh, I think in a post-Western peripheral route world, um, officers are looking at um, measures in terms of delivering the uh, city transport objectives in the city centre master plan, active travel and, and so forth. Okay. I'll, I'll try and bring you back in if you want to come in afterwards. There's a series of uh, questions. Pauline, you'd like to ask a question and then uh, Jamie Green. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my question is to Anna Richardson. Um, I wondered, Anna, if you accept that in many parts of Glasgow, at the moment, you can't get a bus to many parts of the city. Um, and there are many thousands of Glaswegians for whom using a car is not a choice, because they either don't have public transport or public transport is actually more expensive than driving. I put it to you that if you were given these powers, as things stand, Glasgow is not ready for a tax to work. Would you agree? In terms of the way that people move around our city, we do know that we have certain issues that we want to tackle. Uh, we have very low car ownership in Glasgow. I think it's the lowest of all local authorities per capita. So we have uh, uh, almost a contradictory situation where in some cases, uh, as you say, there are some people who have to drive because they have no other option. Uh, on the other mm. hand, we have the majority of people in Glasgow who don't drive 
at all uh, and have to rely on public transport. So when we're looking at bringing in our local transport strategy, we're going to be trying to address both of these issues at once. We want to make sure that people are better connected and at the same time that they're connected more sustainably. So is the city ready for a tax now, would you say? In terms of our local transport strategy, we're going to be looking at all the levers that we have available and we're going so to be looking So you're not really willing to answer that then? To answer it, at the moment we is are... The city ready, is the transport network ready now to, to have a workplace tax? At the moment... Or do you not think it's fairer to actually build up better public transport links before you impose a tax to work? At the moment, we are working proactively with the bus operators to improve the services that they provide, as well as improving other forms of sustainable transport across the city. And that work is ongoing regardless of whether a workplace parking levy power were to be handed to us or not. We are committed to improving the public transport within Glasgow. The workplace parking levy, if we were to consider that as an option, eh, certainly that would be several years down the line. Eh, but our local transport strategy will set out all the different ways that we'll improve the public transport for people of Glasgow. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, you, you've got a chance again. Th thank you. It follows on from Ms McNeill's line of questioning. Do, do you think it's, or does it feel to you reasonable uh, to ask uh, certain groups of people to pay to park at their place of work when they have no other choice, and demonstrably so, to get to that place of work? And that would include groups like those uh, on the lowest uh, earner group, uh, key public sector workers, uh, or indeed those who are in receipt of uh, work-related benefits who drive to work? So these are conversations we need to have around what will be appropriate exemptions. We also, if we look at the SPICE briefing, uh, Transport Scotland statistics show that, generally speaking, those who drive to work are in middle to higher earning households. Uh, we know that those who are um, more vulnerable or who are, have lower household incomes are more likely to be using public transport, and that's something that we need to improve, and we need to have a way of investing to, to improve that. Uh, and we're also aware of the fact that, even across our own employees, many of them are already paying to park at work. Um, we have car parks that we charge our employees to park in, for example. Others park in, um, in uh, car parks around the city, private car parks. Um, the, the principle of, of paying to travel to and from one's work is one that already exists, uh, and workplace parking levy is simply another way of facilitating that. So you do think it's reasonable to expect them to pay that charge? That's my question. I think if we are going to implement such a policy, which we have not yet committed to doing so, uh, then it would be levied, uh, the charge would be, the levy would be on the employer, it would be up to them to decide what they do, and for our own employees, we would consider what the appropriate thing to do would the be. The gentleman have a view on that? I think it's, it's you, a very you, important point. You, you pushed it quite hard, and in fairness, there's quite a lot of other questions, so I, I would like to bring in uh, John Finney and then Richard Lau. OK, uh, thank you, Kavina. It's, it's a question for Mr Grieve, and I understand the hat you're wearing of the Regional Transport Partnership here. And, and uh, um, of course, what we're here to look at is the specifics. There's the generality of workplace parking, and there's been a lot of helpful evidence. But on the, the specifics of the proposal, so after Section 58, Section 3, Subsection 3... <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'll read it to you, Mr. Reeve, I'm not expecting it. <laughs> and that is the power to, to make and modify schemes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it says, and I quote here, two or more local authorities may act jointly. Now, um, I think we have a mechanism for two or more local authorities uh, acting jointly in respect of uh, um, transport matters, and that is the regional transport partnerships. Would you acknowledge that there are opportunities there and perhaps opportunities that, for instance, regional transport partnerships could take a lead on to address the understandable concerns people have, which I hope are all offset by a question I asked you earlier about, you know, money is raised in one area could still be applied in another. No, I accept that. Um, but again, I would go back to the need to align whatever these two authorities might decide to do with a wider regional strategy. Because it would have to be, you know, it would have to all work, it would all have to fit. So the starting point for me is a regional transport strategy. And thereafter, you can work within that to, to achieve what you want to achieve. Maybe one or more authority doing that. Absolutely. With a national transport strategy being consulted on at the moment, yes. um, it would fit in very well to have a regional transport strategy and each local authority to have one as well. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
OK. Richard, uh, followed by Stuart. <laughs> right. Each panel has said it's the employers who are going to pay. No. No. So what do you say to this scenario? I was talking to my bosses yesterday. They say I need to pay this tax. I can't get a bus to my work. So what do I do? You tell me. What, what, what does that person do? Walk? I'll happily start. It Dep depends. <laughs> First of all, it depends whether you provide an alternative or not. Um, you would like to think there would be an option to use a bus at a reasonable cost. Um, it also depends, again, as I said earlier, on the amount of charge that's being talked about and, and what proportion that would be of an individual's journey to work. Um, and again, that proportion varies, obviously, relative to what a certain person earns. I, I go in part in St Enos. Right, it could cost me up to £5, whatever or more. Yep. If I go to the NCP car park, I need to take out a mortgage to get it back. Um, you know, 400 quid a year to somebody who's on a low wage. Sorry, I don't agree. Well, the less you earn, the more impact it has, and I think that's all the more reason to make sure there are public transport alternatives or active travel that's, alternatives. That's that can the be answer. Public transport. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Comment on that. Yeah, in terms of uh, Nottingham's evidence, talking about uh, the levy being a relatively small part of the proportion of the, the cost of <coughs> motoring itself, I think that's something that's significant, and especially if, as Nottingham talked about, making sure that it's on a stepped basis, so those who are earning less would uh, perfectly reasonably pay uh, a smaller levy if the employer chose to pass it on. And that sounded like a very uh, sensible way to move forward. Um, and also, um, within the amendment, uh, I welcome the flexibility around where um, the levy may be um, imposed. So it could be a regional basis, it could be an entire local authority, or perhaps there could be variation within the local authority boundary. And perhaps there's um, an argument there for looking at where there is good public transport accessibility already, and where perhaps is, uh, is less optimal uh, for a workplace parking levy. And all this flexibility is exactly what we need within an amendment to enable us to make a full analysis as part of our transport strategy work. I, I, think I've, I, I think I've said it all. You know, okay. If we don't have decent transport, Nottingham, Nottingham had, had decent transport before they introduced that. And that's why I think other councils, in regard to Mike Rumble's questions, other councils, because Nottingham had their own, same as Edinburgh has. Glasgow, sadly, sold off. You can't get a transport bus, Glasgow City transport bus. It's, it's Lothian buses, Nottingham buses, and that's, that's the catalyst. If you've got a good transport system, then you might be able to get away with this. But, sorry, I ain't walking, walking three miles to my work because I can't afford your, your, your tax. Um. I think that was a statement, so I may push on. <laughs> I may push on to uh, Stuart. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. It would be nice to get the same nine and a half minutes that Richard's had so far, but I suspect I, uh, I, suspect I won't. Um, I've got three fairly brief questions. Um, and the first, the, the, the first is uh, just a very simple question. On your reading of the amendment, is there any power created by the amendment that it's brought forward to charge any individual of, for anything. I think it's to charge the employer, is my understanding. Thank you. That's fine. I just wanted to get that on the absolute record about... I'm not, say, I'm not trying to suggest that you suggest that it has consequences for employees. I'm not trying to take you there. That's a different issue. But the amendment does not create the power <coughs> to charge any individual it only creates the power to charge uh, employees and businesses. That's fine. That's the first one. Um, the, 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 the second one is, I just wanted to be clear, and I think I know the answer, but I want to get it in the record, um, that if Aberdeen, for example, were to introduce a workplace uh, parking levy, um, no company outside the boundaries of Aberdeen City Council would pay anything. Is that correct, Mr. Sweetsman? Is that your understanding of the amendment? I, my understanding is, and, and it, was, it was alluded to earlier, I think, and, and the northeast of Scotland and Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen is, is a fantastic example of any of these measures tend to be done at a regional collaborative basis, and I guess that would be one for Nestrans. So in terms of how such a scheme might be implemented, I don't think we, we know that. 
But, but, but do forgive me. All I'm, I'm just focusing on <laughs> what the amendment says, nothing about how it might be implemented, that the amendment does not create a power for Aberdeen City or Glasgow City or any other city to charge anyone, any business, outside their own boundaries. That's your yes, understanding? Yes, yes. Right, that, that's fine. And my final point, um, just to... It, to re, it is, a, is, I think, an important one, that it presumably costs councils where these are areas into which lots of people come to work quite a lot of money to support the fact that they come into their cities. So is it reasonable, therefore, that in looking at the cost of Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, etc., cetera, uh, providing uh, infrastructure to support people come in, that they have a problem that they as a council have to address and that therefore they should be in control of any revenues that are derived uh, from uh, people who, and businesses who have people who commute into their area. Is that philosophically something that's a reasonable uh, proposition? Although, of course, through regional transport uh, partnerships and otherwise, uh, it would equally, I suggest, be reasonable to, to collaborate and cooperate because there are interactions between policies. Right, and we've got 50 seconds left. Or four minutes. Uh, yeah. Anna, do you want to go very briefly? Yes, yeah, certainly, um, with the responsibility for a city that offers um, investment opportunities that will benefit those who are then employed but live outside the city boundaries through the public realm work that we do, which makes it a more livable, more sustainable place for everybody and hopefully also attracts inward investment. Uh, those are financial burdens on a local authority um, that is representing a large city and that's certainly something uh, that we are obviously doing and yet it will benefit those out with uh, the city boundary uh, for those that are living in the wider area as well. Okay. Um John, I think you've got a question followed by Colin, and then, as convener, I'm going to get the last 15 minutes of questions to myself. No. Uh, John. <laughs> Thank, thanks, convener. I mean, really, to continue the park and ride theme, I mean, that was a big theme for Nottingham. And, I mean, one of the most successful park and rides I'm aware of is Croy, which, which wasn't really planned by anyone, but people just started parking there next to the station, and it grew and grew and grew, and it's been very, very successful. And that's obviously, I think, in North Lanarkshire, if I'm correct and people are either going to Glasgow or Edinburgh. Around Glasgow elsewhere, there's not that same kind of park and ride. So somebody coming from Dumfries might like to park on the southeast of Glasgow, get a train in, because we have got a fabulous train network, I have to say, um, but uh, they just haven't anywhere to park. Would that be a priority for Glasgow, but for other cities as well, uh, do you think, on the park and ride side to feed into the existing very good public transport system? This is where the regional aspect is so important, as Jim said uh, repeatedly today. Uh, certainly with the regional transport strategy that SPT are coming up with and the local transport strategy that Glasgow is, is developing, those need to work in synergy and we can't achieve everything that we want to achieve without the, that regional uh, focus and without uh, those who are coming into our city having other options as well. So do you think, when it says our local authority, and I accept that the definition of Mr Finney is that our local authority can mean two or more local authorities, should we specifically put in there regional transport partnership as well? So we could say a local authority or a regional transport partnership may A, B, C, D, E. Well, I would certainly say yes to that, but I'd be interested to know my, my colleague's views. If you don't want to give me an immediate view. <laughs> in, in our uh, committee paper that went through council, we did talk about the potential for a regional approach, so we certainly uh, would not be unfavourable towards that. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Um, Colin, you wanted to come in. Can I, can I just come back on the point made by Stuart Stevenson, which was to imply maybe that this, because this was a, a levy on um, employers and organisations and businesses, it, it, it somehow wouldn't impact on the employees themselves. I mean, can we just be clear that under the bill, um, is it your understanding <coughs> that this can be passed on to employees and that has been the case in over 50% of the examples in Nottingham? In terms of passing it on, that's part of the, the tool uh, to enable behaviour change. It's the uh, disincentive to driving is the levy being passed on. The incentive to using more sustainable transport is that that money is reinvested in better options. So it's quite clear that it would be impossible to ban businesses passing that on because they could easily find a way around that by, for example, just introducing charges for car parking if that levy was imposed only on businesses and they were banned from passing it on. 
we wouldn't want to ban passing it on because that's okay. part of what causes the behaviour change, which is what we're looking to do as we become more sustainable. Okay, and in terms of passing that on, do you think one of the weaknesses of the bill as it stands at the moment is that it does not make it absolutely clear that that tax should not be regressive, that people on £100,000 shouldn't have to pay the same as somebody on the living wage? Would you support actually putting into the bill making that a more progressive levy whereby it was based on people's ability to pay and not simply a flat rate to all businesses? I don't want to comment on exactly what the wording of the bill should be, uh, but certainly from the conversation that came up in the earlier evidence session around uh, making it more progressive, that's certainly a positive approach. I think it's one that we definitely want to encourage, uh, but I don't want to necessarily comment on whether that should be wording in the bill or whether that should be left for local authorities to determine. There appears to be one follow-up I'm going to allow on that, Mike, Mike Rumbles, and then my question is... It does help reading the actual amendment, uh, and in the amendment it says charges by the occupier of the premises or in such circumstances as the Scottish ministers may by regulation specify by such other person as may be specified. In other words, this is a wide open door. So if we pass this regulation into law, this power gives Scottish ministers by regulation, which we can't amend, to actually, if they so wished, to charge the employer, employee. Do you agree? Jim? Hey, Mike. Um, I'm, only read, I'm only reading actually what Jim. the proposal is. Yeah, if, that, if that's what it says, that, that the, your interpretation of that um, is, is correct. Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one for Anna, if I may, is um, you've obviously done some quite deep thinking on this to work out whether it's a good idea to come up with some ideas. Could you give me some idea of the income that Glasgow thinks it will derive from the working place parking lobby? We haven't got to the stage of doing that level of analysis yet. Uh, until we know whether the power is, is definitely going to be available to us, we've been using our resources on uh, looking at what we can do to improve transport. So we have uh, not yet got any data on exactly how much money would come in from this. Oh, uh, it seems to be an odd way to go about it. I mean, to me, it would be a way of going about what the benefits are the, and the cost. The cost-benefit analysis would be where you'd start before you'd then hone down into it. OK, in, in the past, Glasgow, like most uh, of Scotland, have encouraged working places to develop uh, their sites and build in working place parking. So depending on the square metrage of area that you have has dictated uh, how many car parking spaces you are. So having enforced businesses, bigger businesses in bigger premises to make more parking spaces, you're now going to suggest that it's appropriate to tax them on that policy that you had in the past. So it's a complete reversal. Would that be correct? In terms of our planning policies, I'll admit that I'm not an expert on that particular side of, uh, of council policy. Uh, we have different uh, planning rules around where there are minimum and maximum um, parking spaces required uh, for planning purposes. Uh, and certainly, policy does move on. So perhaps what was deemed um, the, the right way to develop a city 20 or 25 years ago uh, will have changed uh, from now. And I certainly don't think that's uh, something negative. OK. Um, I'm not, it seems, it seems to, it, it's the diesel and petrol argument when it comes to cars that you're encouraged to do one thing and then, and then hammered for it, for it later, which I, I, is, is quite difficult. And the final thing on the planning side before I ask my last question is that do you, do you agree that if uh, businesses saw the working place parking levy coming along that they would feel that they should appeal their ratings value uh, on the basis that ratings values are based on rental values and if you're paying a substantially large tax on parking places that you would look to get your rental to your landlord reduced because as somebody who was a surveyor, that's something I, I, I would have immediately do and put to the assessor. Do you think that's going to be a problem? It's not an area I've got any expertise on, but it's certainly an interesting point. OK, does that, Richard, do you want to come back on that? And just to, to observe, I think that would be a, an inevitable consequence of, it, of any consultation that is needed if, if we look at uh, the, the same argument, uh, the same speculation has come up in relation to the transient tourism levy um, and I think um, the impact in terms of other charges for businesses needs to be look, looked at in the round. Okay, so my final question is a, uh, is a selection question for each of you, if, if you may. 
um, on the basis that working past place parking levy is, is to improve the environment that we live in. Uh, which would you place at the top of your list to get the best results for the environment? Uh, low, end, uh, low emission zones, congestion charging, or working place parking levy? And you may choose one. We've already got a low emission zone as an air quality uh, tool. Uh, the workplace parking levy, if we were to implement such no, a no. thing, would be to reduce congestion and improve the movement of the city. It's different to air quality. So, so that, that's a One very a good half. politician's answer, <laughs> which, which I'm not sure that you've chosen low emissions zones, Jim. Uh, low emissions the, zones, without okay. a doubt. And Richard? I think in terms of, of city centre as opposed to city uh, council boundaries, I think low emission zones is, is, is pretty key in, in terms of attracting, in our case, global international talent into, into live and work in the city centre. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a very interesting evidence session. And thank you very much for the evidence that you've given to the committee this morning. Um, it will certainly go a long way to informing us on how to come up uh, with our views on, on this amendment to the Transport Bill. So thank you very much and thank you for coming in. And uh, that concludes today's committee business. And I'd now like to close the meeting. Uh, committee members, would you like...